There it goes. I see you. Hello, Mark. Make your Viking pretty good. Going to pantomime tonight, so can't stay long. What is pantomime? Musical comedy stage production. Cool. Sneak some pictures. <laughs> I got these meatballs at um Walmart. They are they're meatballs with a grape chili sauce. They are so good. Mind bending good. And um of course limited edition, so they're gone now and we can't get them anymore. I got one bag left in the freezer. So I'm trying to figure out how to make them myself. And um I found a grape chili recipe. Just take a jar of chili sauce and a jar of grape jelly and that's it. And it worked. It is good. Not as good as the the grape chili meatballs in the bag, but um, it is pretty good. The only problem is the the sauce is you know liquidy, and I haven't figured out how to how do you make it thicker? Because I noticed the sauce that came with it, you know, it stuck to the meatballs better. While this sauce is a bit more um, it's a bit more liquid. Hello, Woozius. So I used the new um, Instant Pot Dutch Oven. It worked great. But um, I haven't figured out how to make it thicker yet. We will do our best. Happy victims. Hello, Mr. Pagar. Um, well, the, that's just it, though. That's going to make it, um... I guess you could try. I mean, the worst you could do is not work, right? Can't imagine it would hurt. Can you use regular flour? Or does it have to be corn flour?
I have tapioca flour. I have a whole bag of that. It was a freebie, so I grabbed it. <laughs> Never turn down free food. Hi, kitty. Are you still hungry? Hmm? It's going to be nice today. It's going to get close to 60. It's the weirdest thing to have, you know, 50, 60 degree days and 20 degree nights. <laughs> Someone made an updated version of the little Nico Cat. So I got the little Nico Cat on my screen. <laughs> I love that. It's great. Oh, his tail's clipped. One of you guys, Jeff, he was in the area, so we went to Outback Steakhouse a couple days ago. That was fun. He got himself a, um, a mistletoe. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta check out other recipes for the grape chili. Yeah, they all just call for just chili sauce and jelly. It's weird.
Someone else has tried it with whole cranberries too and said it came out pretty good. Something I definitely want to do those. Hey, Colin. Um, I want to cut the meatballs in half so more of the sauce can penetrate the meatballs. Because um, frozen meatballs, you know, they're pre-cooked, and so they um, they tend to have like sort of a skin on the outside, not like a skin, but like a a shell that's a little more difficult to penetrate. Like I noticed that um, when I bit a meatball in half and then dipped it in the sauce again, um, it tasted better. So I'm thinking, um, once they're thawed, you know, cut all the meatballs in half. So they can really soak up the sauce. Merry Christmas, DeWitt. Merry Christmas to all my critters and victims. <laughs> Well, when we had that windstorm last week, it tore apart by two canopies out front. Um, I'm actually surprised they lasted as long as they did. And surprisingly minimal damage. The, um, the one leg got bent. I was actually able to straighten it and close the t canopy, which was amazing. That's, that doesn't usually work. <laughs> usually once they're bent, that's it. I mean, it can't be used, but I was able to close it at least. And um, the other one, one of the X frames, is bent. But um, um, they're supposed to be commercial grade canopies. And well, well, the first plus on there, and is the the one canopy had some. Oh no, we had seventy mile an hour winds. <laughs> seventy miles an hour. <laughs> the one canopy somehow ended up from over here. To over here in the front yard and there's like a steel carport between oh yeah oh yeah I, I saw a couple of videos of truckers just like literally praying in their cabs hoping they weren't gonna blow over they're sitting there stopped waiting it out and they're just praying they're not gonna blow over you know seeing their wheels come up off the ground and crap it's just Jesus some heavy winds and um, we were hitting 65 70 miles an hour here and um, so somehow the canopy had ended up on the other side of the carport upside down. So I, of course, you know, it was freezing cold, but I just quickly, you know, took the canopies off the metal frames so they wouldn't act as sails and keep blowing away. But um, I, I still can't figure out how did it get from there to there. I, it can't just roll there. There's a, there's a metal carport in the way. So how did it get there? The, the only thing I can figure is it went up and over that it got lifted up and went over top of the carport and came down the other side I wish I had video of that <laughs> I checked the camera but it didn't catch it if it did do that the angles wrong but I was like holy shit <laughs> um, so hopefully they will replace the broken parts so I'm going to contact the, the seller see if he'll because the good news is, being commercial grade, which so far it looks like they might be, because I'm pretty impressed by them, is that it's all held together by bolt, nuts and bolts, not rivets. Which means it should be serviceable. And um, we shall see. All the fabric is good, the canopies are fine, most of the frame is fine, just the one leg and the one X frame. So it should be a pretty easy, you know, repair. We shall see. Hopefully they'll stand behind it. and Because um, <coughs> if they stand behind that, it's going to get a good review. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty impressed by them. I mean, I wouldn't call them, you know, commercial easy up quality. But they're also half the price of commercial easy up. I'd call them like a middle ground 
call it um call it uh I guess I uh, call it um low end commercial quality. And I uh, know based on the price I'm pretty impressed. Nice. Excellent, man. Very, very cool. Well, my Sunday was completely occupied. <laughs> we spent six hours sitting in this chair right here, and then some. And I made Michelle sit in that chair there <laughs> with me, or Monday. And um, I'm going to show you guys the keys and the deer that I've been printing. Because I had to completely erase Michelle's identity and start all over. It's not my fault. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. No, it's not because I didn't know the guy had somebody acting the. Yeah, but if you didn't, if you didn't give him our information to begin with, none of this would have happened. I didn't give him the information to Facebook or anything. Uh huh. I didn't. Uh huh. I don't have it. So she got a brand new phone number, brand new Google account, brand new email address, brand new Facebook account. So somehow, we reset her password. Facebook has a serious problem, and they need to do something about this. We changed her password, because this is not her fault. This is Facebook's problem. We changed her password, and we enabled two-factor authentication. Yet somehow, the scammer who was scamming her with the, with the, with the um, gift cards was logged into her Facebook account. I, I get a message from Messenger from Michelle, and it says, idiot. And I was like, moron. <laughs> like, no, you're the moron. I was like, uh, you need to be bitten. And he's like, yeah, you who? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm going to come in there and bite you right now. I go into her room, and I just barge right in. I'm getting ready to bite her, and she's not reacting. And she's just looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, I came to bite you. He's like, why? And I'm like, Show me your phone. <laughs> and, and she pulls her phone. I was like, bring up Messenger. And she looks at the screen. And you can just see her face. And I knew instantly I was right. She's like, I didn't send that. <laughs> I get another message from her while I'm standing there in front of her. So this guy is in her Facebook account. And I cannot remove him. Okay, this, this is the messed up part. This is really, really messed up. And this is something that... that, that, that this is a big problem. I, 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 what do you even do about something like this? So, if you go into your Facebook account, you have to click on this little down arrow here and go to Settings and Privacy. And then you go to Settings. And then there's this screen right here called Security and Login. You click on Security and Login, and this is where you secure your PC. See? This is where you're logged in from. This is how you change your password, enable two-factor authentication, and when you secure your account, one of the things you can do from here is log everybody out. So it'll log every instance that's currently logged in to log out because, you know, if you're already in, it doesn't fix anything. I cannot load this screen. On her old account, this screen will not load. You click on this, and it just shows up as this but it won't change to this. It just shows a little circle turning. Her new account, no problem. My account, no problem. That one account he's logged into cannot get to the screen, which means we cannot evict him. Which means he did something intentionally to prevent this screen from loading. That should not be possible. Um, no, at that point, I just said, screw this, we're, we're going nuclear. And we're evicting everything. And, um, oh no, th that's the weird thing. I finally got the reset password th screen to come up on her phone. And it logged me in as his account. We were logged in as him. Like we, I, I oh, oh, I got in, it worked. No, it's, it's his name that came up. You, no, no, that's just it. You can't log off all users because you have to get to the security and login screen to log off all users, and he had rigged it so you can't get to that screen. I don't know how. No, it's not the computer because when Michelle had this problem, 
we came to my computer and logged into her Facebook account and could not get to that screen. It wasn't a computer compromise. It was a Facebook compromise. He had done something server-side on Facebook. <laughs> oh, no. There's, there's no way that wasn't intentional. Her new account, no problem. My account, no problem. The one account he's logged into, we can't log him out of? Bullshit. I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> I do not believe in coincidences. You know, coincidentally, it failed in such a way that we couldn't get rid of him? Nah. No way. Bullshit. <laughs> he did something. Their system is broken, and he was able to do something to prevent that screen from loading on her account. Because, you know, when we when I realized we had a problem on her phone, because that's she doesn't access Facebook from a PC. She only accesses it from her phone. So I loaded up her Facebook account on my PC. Same problem. So it's something on Facebook's side. Yeah, but when, yeah well, obviously it's a bug, but it's a bug that he was intentionally able to invoke. He was able to invoke it somehow. Oh, yeah, he did it. He absolutely did it. And um, so I just nuked everything. I, I did the um, send your ID to Facebook because I want to nuke that old account to get him out of it. I don't want him masquerading as her. And um, as soon as I as soon as I realized it was him, I was like, "Oh, this is Mister, you know, uh, Omega Black Ops Black Ops with a general who's mad at him guy, right? Right?" <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> he's like, he's like, well, I know where you live, and I was like, I eat people. <laughs> I was like, get here quick. The cast iron's hot. <laughs> he, he, he says, well, I'm gonna visit your mom and your sister first, and I was like, you fucking asshole. You lead me on and you drag me on. I get the cast iron all hot, and you're 20 hours away from me. You teasing little prick. <laughs> I was like, they'll cook you instead. <laughs> he bullshitting, of course, but... Uh, I'm so I'm actually working when we go... We, I was able to reset all of her accounts and change all of her logins, everything, except for her bank. I made the mistake of changing her phone number first. And, of course, because I changed her phone number, I can't two-factor authenticate with the phone number. <laughs> because I don't have access to the phone number anymore. Ah, that was dumb. So we have to go to the actual bank location to change her email address and phone number. Yeah. And um, I'm starting to think that, okay, normal check fraud is they make a fake check. They send you a fake check. You deposit it. The bank says, oh, you're a good customer. We're going to clear the funds right away for you. Uh, no, two-factor by phone is wonderful. It is, it's convenient, it's easy, and it's, it's, it's reasonably effective. Two-factor by phone is very good. You can also do two-factor by email, but it just happened to be set up to be by phone for that account. But two-factor by email, however, is dangerous. Hacking email accounts is pretty easy. Yeah, but there's more security flaws with the email than there are with phone. I mean, cloning her SIM card is a little more difficult to do. The whole system needs to be revamped. The whole system has many, many flaws in it. So, um... But anyway, why is this guy still bugging her about these checks? He knows he's, he knows he's caught. He knows he's exposed. He knows he knows what we did, what he did. Why is he still on her about the checks? Well, see, normally they make a fake check, you deposit it, they get you to send them the money, and then, of course, the check bounces because it's a fake check, and then you're stuck with the debt. But I'm starting to wonder if these checks are real, like if there's actual money behind these checks. Like he's working at some company and he forged some checks or he stole some checks or something like that because it's almost like he's on a time limit. So we're going to take, normally I keep those kind of checks and we just put them up on the wall as a trophy. We're going to take those checks to the bank and give them to their fraud department. Because maybe they can track down who this guy is and, or, or at least, you know, warn the company he's trying to defraud. 
you know, to be careful of them. Exactly, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that the, that there's there's some legitimacy behind these checks, and that you know either he can get in trouble or he has limited time to access those funds. So we're gonna give when we go and update her information at the bank, we're gonna give the banks the checks and hopefully they can do something with them and track down Mr. Omega Black Ops. <laughs> <laughs> who knows but it's just well now she's got brand new everything so except for some reason I when I created a new Google account for her I think it created her Google account under my Google account and I gotta I gotta make sure that is not the case I do not want her account connected to my account because every time I turn on my computer, it would log me in as her instead of log me as me, and I'd have to change it. So I need to fix that just to make sure it's not um, actually connecting the two accounts. It's because I was logged in as you when I did it. But uh, it's it's kind of weird. It's just, you know, and of course, as you know, changing your identity online is a very long, involved process. Because, well, they make it hard because they don't want to make it easy for criminals. <laughs> so, you know, changing every username and, you know, authenticating every change and, oh, what a, what a pain in the ass. Well, with her, it was, it was a lot easier. With me, you'd be talking weeks to change everything. Weeks, if not months. But with her, it was a little bit easier because we could just, ab we could just abandon all the old information. You know, she didn't need what was in the old accounts. She wasn't she wasn't vested too deeply in any of those accounts. So we could just abandon them and start over. So with her, it was possible to do that. With me, it would not be so possible to do that. At least not so easily. <laughs> but what are you going to do? People are weird, man. Some people need to be eaten. So I've been working on, continuing to work on the keys. I'm still tweaking. So I've got resin, PLA, resin PLA hybrids. I finally got the pieces in. So this is the um, enhanced one. So you can see there's a little socket there. And that socket takes a little metal plate. So let me pop that out so you can see what that looks like. I haven't glued them in yet. So I found these um, these little metal plates, and there's a obviously printed in socket to hold that plate right there. Mm -hmm. And this thing just pops right in there and fits like a glove. Um, so. Theoretically, the resin one could work. I still have to tweak the length. I don't think the length is quite right. Because I have to make sure that this um, metal tab is inside the, the the lock tumbler. So the idea is that if you insert this key into the lock tumbler like that, and then turn the key, as long as you grab the key down here where the metal is, now the metal is absorbing the torque of turning instead of the plastic. Yeah, the entire key is printed. The whole thing. This is actually a resin print, so the whole thing is printed just like that. Here, do I have another one here? No. Here's a like a, here's a key head that's designed to take a key. So you literally just you take one of the printed keys and you stick it inside there, and there you go. Um, that's how I can make hybrids. Now here's the other idea. This blows me away how well this worked. All right, I want you to look at this closely and see if you can see what's so special about this key. I even got the key logo on there. But do you see it? Do you see what's so special about that? Look at this. Uh, one millimeter carbon fiber rod. And there's a slot. There's a hole 
in the key to accept. Look at that. And that's resin printed and uh, no support. And so the carbon fiber rod slides right in and I didn't have to sand anything. I didn't have to shift anything. It just fit like a freaking glove right off the printer. That is, this is using the longer 3D triple 4K printer, the one I've been using for the past month. This thing is amazing. <laughs> the resolution is so freaking clean that the carbon rods, there's two of them, you can see there's two in there. The carbon rods fit in there like a freaking glove. Now I still have to glue them in. The idea is that you stick the key in, the carbon rods will absorb the torque. Also in theory, if the key breaks, it should act like, um, well, because, okay, here's the problem. If the key shatters, this ends up stuck in the lock. And that's a big problem. <laughs> I broke this outside the lock, stress testing it to see how much it could take. This particular PLA shatters, so I can't use this, this PLA. A um, different PLA... I don't have one handy, um, but different PLA, you know, you see this one shatters. No, it's not. Okay, this one's, see, this, see how this one's bending? Okay, that's what you want. That's why I use PLA, because it bends, and you'd rather have it bend than have it shatter, because if it bends, you can still pull the key out. <laughs> if it shatters, if it breaks, um, I don't know if I want to take a torch to an electronic ignition lock. It uh, sounds like a pretty good way to fuck up your car. <laughs> um, so the idea is you can't... That's the problem with the resin keys. Is the... Um, the resin is very... It's very soft. And, the, and resin is homogenous. So resin doesn't have a stronger direction and a weaker direction. At least not really. It technically does. Because there technically is layers. Just like a um, an FDM print. It's just not quite the same. So... Um, I need to make, I need to, first of all, the key isn't strong enough. Uh, although I almost got a pure PLA key strong enough. I almost got, it actually did work. I was able to unlock the door. I was able to start the car. I figure I might get four or five uses out of it. Uh, there's no transponder in these. And even if there was, the transponder is easy to bypass. So like, for example, my Nissan Quest has a transponder key. The very first thing I did was tear apart the spare key, take out that little chip, and I embedded the chip in the dash around the key. So now I can just cut any key I want, and it'll fit, and it'll the chip's already there. Um, P, uh, ABS is too soft. That won't work. Pet G is too soft. That won't work. Um, PLA, is, PLA is brittle compared to Pet G and ABS, but it's not actually brittle, as you can see. I was able to I was able to twist the living shit out of this and it did not break there we go as you can see I was able to twist the living hell out of that and it didn't break now some PLAs will crack like this one that one cracked so I want to avoid those <laughs> So, um, a couple of ideas I came up with is, one, metal plates. And so far, the metal plates look like they're going to be the best. You cannot use carbon fiber PLA. That would be worse, not better. Remember, all filled, all filled plastics are weaker. No exceptions. There is no exception to this rule. Any plastic that has something embedded in it is weaker. Because you're creating voids in the plastic, including nylon. Nylon is carbon fiber nylon is weaker than non-carbon fiber nylon. Now, the difference with nylon is that nylon has so much excess strength. It is so strong that you can afford to give up some of that strength in order to gain the rigidity qualities of the carbon fiber. 
So you're still making the plastic weaker, but you can do it. You can. It, it is acceptable to make it weaker because, for example, uh, uh, carbon fiber PLA is structurally useless. Um, it's so weak, it's ridiculous. I mean, you drop apart and it shatters. Okay? It comes apart. Um, it is beautiful, however. If you've ever printed carbon fiber PLA, you know what I'm talking about. It is gorgeous. The finish on the model, there's just something magical about it. But structurally, it's useless. Petchy, not much better. Um, what you're doing is you're trading strength for stiffness. You're giving up strength and you're gaining rigidity. The problem is with PLA, Petchy, and ABS, you don't have any strength to give up. You know, giving up any strength compromises the part. So you want to use actually the purest PLA you can, um, the, with the with the least amount of excess crap in it. Like for example, so far my strongest one is the filamentum one. It's a really high quality, clean PLA. Um, the PLA is so stiff that I only need one metal insert. So I just need the one metal insert in the key. I don't need one on the other side. Um, polycarbonate would probably be similar. You can afford to give up some strength in exchange for the change in qualities. Um, so imagine if if this is your strength scale, okay? And PLA, you need this much strength. But when you add the carbon fiber, you now have this much strength. Well, now you're below your threshold of what you need. Well, let's say this is how much strength you need. Nylon has this much strength. When you add the carbon fiber, now it has this much strength. But it's still more than the strength you need. So you have enough excess strength that you can afford to give up some of it in order to gain the qualities of the carbon fiber. So with nylon and possibly polycarbonate, that can work. With PLA, that does not work. The plastic itself becomes inadequate once you add the carbon fiber to it. Um, I've been trying to figure out a way to do it with just PLA. I've been tweaking, cheating, adjusting, you know, making the center shaft thicker and stuff like that. Just trying little tricks to see if I can gain that, that tiny bit of extra strength. And I'm close. It's, it's pretty close. But the reality is, you just get a bag of these and you keep them in the drawer. And now I can make a hundred keys. So, no big deal. Um, but this allows me to use PLA. And since I printed a literal gaggle of these print heads, these little heads, all I have to print is this. And that, even with the raft, is a 14-minute print. So if I ever lose the keys to the car, I'm 14 minutes away from a replacement. <laughs> That's awesome. That I can't get to a locksmith in 14 minutes. <laughs> It's literally faster than a locksmith. It's awesome. And here's one printed on a raft. The raft was actually printed a little too close, so it's a little hard to remove. And um, so I gotta, I gotta increase the raft distance just a tiny bit. I also gotta work on the bridging. The bridging on the underside is pretty icky. You can see the underside bridging on that is pretty messed up. Simplify 3D is doing something weird with the bridging that I haven't figured out how to tell it to stop doing. So I gotta work on that. I gotta play with that. But so far, I'm really impressed. So this week, I'll be um, I'll glue the carbon fiber one together just to see if it works. And um, I think it will. The idea is the carbon fiber will add enough stiffness to allow me to turn the key. See, engaging the lock with the bidding, that's no problem. That's easy. The, the keys work fantastically. But the key serves a double function. As you, I talked last week, you, you have to be able to turn the lock. And it's not a simple switch. You know, when you turn the key, you're physically moving a tumbler and physically moving a shaft, which is moving an arm, which is actually moving a lock, a physical lock. So the key needs to be strong enough to do that. Same with the ignition. The key needs to be strong enough to turn that ignition and engage that switch. And um, the ignition is a little bit easier than the door lock. But you got to get the door lock to be able to get into the car to use the ignition. And worse, these modern cars, in order to 
to make them cheaper, there's one door lock on the entire car. The whole car has one door lock. The back doors, the passenger door, and the hatch do not have a lock. They, they don't have a key lock. You know, they have a lock, but there's no keyhole. Only the driver's door has a keyhole, which means if you damage or clog that keyhole, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> like you're big time screwed and um if you ever have that happen if you ever break a key off inside the door lock if most of the key is in the door lock do not try to extract it get out your um i uh, can't do that that would make it worse um get out your leatherman or your screwdriver stick it in the hole and turn it Get the car unlocked before you start dicking with getting the parts out. Uh, sure. If I wanted to buy a thousand dollars worth of IPA and sit there for the next week and a half dripping IPA in there until it dissolved the plastic, sure, that would work. Um, the case in point, <laughs> I'm not trying to be a dick, but case in point, these parts have been soaking in 91% IPA for two days and they still exist okay it, it doesn't work that way IPA dissolves the resin IPA does not readily dissolve the cured part it might eventually break down the cured part but not nearly as rapidly as you think <laughs> it's not like squirt five minutes okay we're in now uh, you know, a couple weeks, maybe. <laughs> With some high-grade IPA going through there, maybe. <laughs> but, um, um, so far, the best solution looks like it's going to be, because it works for both FDM and resin, and it's also cheaper, and it's also very effective, um, is going to be the, the metal disc, the little metal tab. Um, this one's single-sided. You know, single-sided. You know, this pops out. And then here's your metal tab that fits right in there. I still have to glue it in. I have not glued it in yet. Uh, yes, there is water-soluble filament. But um, you're not going to print the whole key out of that. That's kind of silly. It's called HIPS. Actually, I think there's a couple different kinds. But HIPS is a water-soluble filament. And, um... Uh, my favorite so far is the resin double-sided. I think that might actually work really well. Um, it's actually the longest to print. It takes like an hour and a half to print that versus 14 minutes to print that. Um, but it looks really nice. I also love that I can put custom logos on it. So here I got the, the Kia logo on one side. And I got the name of my car on the other side, Soul Reaper. So that came out really well. I also decided to not permit a key ring. Because you don't want to put these on a key ring. You're going to break them. You put these on a key ring. They're, you're going to break them. So I, I decided to go to a no hole design. To discourage putting it on a key ring. But um, that worked. That I'm, I'm very pleased with how this came out. Now it's just a matter. The, the problem I have now is that the. The key goes a certain distance into the lock. The problem is, the distance it goes into the door is different than the distance it goes into the ignition. The door is a shorter insertion distance than the ignition. So if I make the key short enough to be perfect for the door, it's too short for the ignition. So I gotta hope that the uh, balance in between the two locks is less than 16 millimeters so that I can make sure that Merry Christmas Ronald so I can make sure that this metal plate engages the lock see the metal plate engaging lock is what's going to keep the key from bending it's what's going to keep the key from breaking because now the, that metal that, that stainless steel plate that will absorb the torque of turning kinda like when you're picking a lock and you have the torque bar and you're in there and you're picking and you're using the torque bar to turn the lock you don't turn the lock with a pick because the pick will just bend. You turn the lock with the torque bar. So basically my printed keys are basically the pick. 
I need a torque bar. The It's almost strong enough. There's probably a PLA out there that is strong enough. Like, for example, the yellow one, the one that I printed out of this yellow PLA, they worked. They worked. Um, I also came up with some tricks. So, for example, let me see if I can find an original one. Do I have any original ones left? Uh, I may have... I may have destructively analyzed all the original ones. Actually, the resin one is a good one. So, I realized that sometimes you do not want to replicate reality because you're 3D printing. You don't have to adhere to reality. So, this is the key. And you see there's the bidding of the key. And then you have this, this um, channel. Yeah, Prusim, you're right. Prusimin is a very good quality PLA. I'll have to try them. Also, Atomic makes some really good PLA, too. Merry Christmas, El Mariachi. Um, Merry Christmas, Ronald. So, you know, it has this channel going up the middle. And I realized, I don't need the channel. That's just how they machine the keys. I only need the channel to go... I only need that much. You know, so you can see there's the little bit of the channel right there. I'm going to get rid of that too because I don't think I need that either. So the more of that I can get rid of, the stronger the shaft of the key is. And that made the difference from the PLA key not working to the PLA key working. I've also started rounding the corners, rounding the edges, you know, making everything nice and smooth, dialing in the um, extrusion multiplier so I have a nice smooth print now with no gaps and no overlap. And I'm getting there. I'm getting closer and closer. And once I once I get the right um, optimal configuration, then I'll be able to just tell everybody how to do that. Um, I still haven't tried to print a normal key because I actually don't have a normal key. Well, I mean, normally you'd do a house key, but my door locks don't have keys. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah, we're getting closer and closer. I mean... The, the metal plate solves the problem completely, but I'm, I'm still I'm still trying to figure out how to do it without the metal plate. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it with just the PLA. And I'm getting close. Definitely, I like doing the heads in the... Um, they, they, they don't come out bad in the, the PLA. So here's the PLA one. So there's the Kia logo. And there's the Soul Reaper. So they really don't come out bad. They come out pretty nice. Uh, they take twice as long. I do them at 0.12 layer height, and they come out nicer. Hey, Fitzney. Um, I, I, I got a cooling issue on that CR6SE, though, because you can see that is not a deep overhang by any stretch of the word. But you can see there's a cooling issue. See how, see how it's a little sloppy there? It's, it's not cooling properly. That should not be a problem. Because that is not a steep overhang. I mean, it's like 15 degrees. <laughs> wow. Black so Black that's a cooling thing i got to work on with that. But um, I heard you. Thank you, Michelle. But this is probably going to be pretty close to the um, the final usable one. You know, just got to tweak the length. I think I need to make this a hair shorter, like 2 millimeters shorter. And um, to make sure that that plate engages everything correctly. And um, go from there. Hello, EPP. Merry Christmas, buddy. And um, but yeah, that's working pretty good. I'm I'm really pleased with the progress. I have lots and lots and lots. Thankfully, it takes very very little plastic to actually do anything. So I have so many test prints. <laughs> I just have zillions. <laughs> uh, annealing won't work. Um, annealing makes it harder, but makes it more brittle. But the problem with annealing, it shrinks. And you can't have it shrink. You would spend hours adjusting your print to try to find the right size so that when it shrinks, it's the correct size to fit in the lock. That would be a nightmare. Uh, maybe I'll try it once just for the hell of it. Because these would be pretty easy to anneal. Just, you know, put a brick in the oven... Put these on top of the brick. Put another brick on top of them. You know, small brick. Um, to keep them from warping. 
So it'd be pretty easy to do. So I might try that. Maybe they, maybe the maybe the shrinkage will be small enough that it won't stop it from working. So I may try that and see how big of an effect that has on the um the strength of the part. But what I don't want is it to become more brittle. <laughs> you, you don't want brittle. You want soft. You just need you need rigid enough to turn the lock. But soft enough that if it begins to fail. Where'd that go? You need to make sure that if it begins to fail, that it does this and not this. Bad? Good. <laughs> so, you know, this is great. I know. Uh, I mean, look how far I twisted that key. There's no way I'm going to turn the lock that much to make it do that. I would stop before it got to that point, which means this key has zero chance of breaking off in the lock, and that's what you want. Merry Christmas, Asgard. So that's the important thing is to make sure it does not break off in the lock. Hello, Day UK. Merry Christmas. Uh, no, we haven't got no ham yet. We're actually going over to the neighbors for dinner. Uh, our neighbors, about two miles away, invited us over for dinner. So I'm working on... Um, the um my grape chili meatballs to bring over and then i'm also going to run down to costco today and grab one of their pumpkin pies because that was freaking evil i they sell the pies for six dollars and not only is it only six dollars the pie is this big it's like a 16 inch pie a 15 inch pie so it's huge it's literally twice the size of the pies you get at the grocery store for twelve ninety nine, and it tastes a thousand times better. I I have not tasted homemade pie that tastes as good as Costco pie. I cannot believe how good their pumpkin pie is. It's it's amazing, and you have to eat it quick too. If you touch a piece and put it back in, it's moldy in two days. So it's fresh. There's no preservatives in there. It's car keys and christmas day <laughs> but um yeah i mean if, if you have access to a costco try their pumpkin pie it'll blow your brains out your, your brains will be on the wall behind you it's i mean it's that good it, it's really shockingly good pie so the other thing i kind of got into printing was the christmas deer you guys remember the christmas deer right these guys If you remember, a couple years ago, I printed these in, um, like, the glitter red filament and gold filament. Well, this is what the longer... Ouch. What, COVID restriction? So this is one of the deer. And you see, it did a fantastic job, of course. And this is not even high resolution. This is printed at 0.1 millimeters. This is printed in four hours. <laughs> it printed fast. It's hollow, of course. Oh, I missed the opportunity. I should have put the drain hole in his butt. <laughs> um, but yeah, that came out beautiful. I'm very, very pleased with that. There is... Um, someone did point out, um, Telly Morelli, Telly, I remember his name on Facebook, he pointed out that it was banding, but it's not banding. Um, there's like a defect right there. Almost like the, um, the model shifted a little bit when it got to that point. They put 1911 as his birth year? Oh, Jesus. You know, you think they would use their brain and realize somebody made a mistake and let it go through. It's like, come on. That's such an obvious mistake. You're going to hold somebody up for that? Oh, yeah, really, especially when you can get cheap resin, and especially with a, a mono printer, triple 4K printer that's so freaking fast, it's ridiculous. I mean, that's just absolutely beautiful. You see, here's my drain holes down here. Got a drain hole at the bottom of each leg. And then I have a drain hole at the back of his head here. Merry Christmas, John. So that's the, the normal main deer. And then you have the prancer. 
and this one you can tell it did need support the bottom of the um, antlers is a little bit flattened but it succeeded and it printed it that's that's something you're not going to get away with on a um on an FDM printer that's for sure but this is the prancer one with the leg up I just added my own support you can actually see the remnants of the support are still on there the little spikes there we go so that's the prancer version then you have the lay down ones you know the right and the left lay down ones uh, they're printed standing up just like this these again printed standing up just like that here I did put the um, drain hole in his butt <laughs> See, you see, that's what I, that's what you call zero tolerance, zero intelligence. You know, use your brain, okay? <laughs> there's a time to be strict with rules and, and stuff like that, and then there's a time to use your brain. <laughs> they elected not to use their brain. Huh? Yeah, it's supposed to be up here, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be up here right below the tail. But I was trying to hide it, so I stuck it in that opening in there, so I can, you know, make it less visible. And then the other one is on the back of his head, because you have to be able to drain it so that it doesn't fill with resin. But also, you want the alcohol to get on the inside, so you want to fill it with alcohol, drain it, fill it, drain it, fill it, drain it. You want no residual resin on the inside, otherwise it's going to crack, and you don't want that. And then, um. I also have, this is my favorite one. This one came out stunning. I just, I'm blown away how nice this came out. Let me move my deer all over here. The Voronoi one. Look at that. That came out so freaking good. It just blows my mind you can do with a resin printer. Huh. I don't know. It should be. It should be neutral, non-toxic once fully cured. The trick is you got to make sure it's fully cured. And um, something like this where the UV light can access every portion of the model, I would say probably, especially if you coat it, something like this, I would never trust because you have no way of knowing for sure the hollow interior of the model is actually cured. So that's something you would have to consider. Oh, sweet. Let me log in and check that out. Thank you, Day UK. I appreciate that. Now, yeah, if you can get a UV LED on the inside, if your if your access to the hollow interior is sufficient enough to get UV light on the inside, then yes, that would work. But most of the time, we don't have that kind of access to the inside of the model. Thank you, buddy. 19 bucks US. I appreciate that. You rock. Right, but, um, I'm going back to my that Voronoi one is just mind blowing. So, for example, um, see, here's the thing, though. I wouldn't do it uncoated. <laughs> I wouldn't do it uncoated. Um, Michelle, could you give me a drink? Because um, alcohol will still interact with the plastic. So, for example, it would be great for making little shot glasses. Because you can make super highly detailed little shot glasses. You can make them transparent. But I would coat the part. So I would polyurethane the part. 
once you polyurethane apart, you're food safe. But beyond that, I don't know enough about these plastics to say whether that's safe or not. I just don't know. A candy dish? Yes. You're going to be fine with a candy dish. You know, if you want a 3D printed candy dish to put on your countertop or something like that, I think you'll be just fine. Like a dish to put pretzels in, something like that, you'll be fine. I ate cereal. Okay. Oh yeah, Michelle and I are eating cereal like for every meal. Like we're eating cereal like twice a day now. <laughs> the um the grocery store had um, milk that was one day from you know the Best Buy date, fifty cents a gallon. We bought four gallons. <laughs> I would have bought eight gallons, but there's no way we could use it before it goes bad. And uh, so I figure if we eat a lot of cereal and macaroni and cheese and you know and I oatmeal and stuff like that, you know things that need milk, I figure we can use four gallons before it goes bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're 50 cents a gallon? Hell yes. I'm the one who told you about it. Yeah, she found it. She called me up and was like, they got skim milk for 50 cents a gallon. I was like, get it. <laughs> I was like, grab it. Grab two. No, three. No, four. Grab four. <laughs> you can't beat that price. But that one is just... Ah, oh, that's, that's incredible. That's beautiful. I want it in pink. What I want now is I want a high-resolution Eiffel Tower. You know, they have the Eiffel Tower print, but it's not actually that high a resolution. It's detailed, but it's not high... Re it's not, well, it's, it's high resolution, but it's not detailed. What I want is a crazy detailed Eiffel Tower because this machine is capable of doing it. Hi, everyone. The resolution of this screen on this thing is so high, it's ridiculous. Hi, everyone. You know they can't talk back, right? <laughs> you, so you can't I hear I know but everyone. I'm saying but you said it twice they can't they can hear you but you can't hear them you'd have to see a reply here okay dear <laughs> yeah we're doing good we're doing okay um but yeah that that's just that came out great um, I'm very pleased with that so that's all my deer I got a whole bunch of deer now so I got the these, these two are the same, just one's Voronoi. <laughs> Can't you hear us yelling? <laughs> and then you got the Prancer, and then you have the two, the left and right, um, sitting deers. So they have a fawn, but it's low quality. It, it, it's not worth it to print that on this. Um, but um, yeah, if anybody knows of any other really nicely, highly detailed, clean models like this, you know that are low support requirements. Uh, let me know. I want. I want to. I want to sick them on this printer. All right, have fun. I don't know, but I I know the actual Eiffel Tower is more detailed than the model. The model is actually simple shapes. I'm I'm just hoping that you know when I, I could find a higher detail model. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe nobody ever had a reason to make one. I have no idea. Who is that? Who is what? Ui. Pygar. He said hi, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, well, family friendly. <laughs> you know, family friendly model. So, you know, it's something I could put on the screen here without getting demonetized. <laughs> okay, I'm going back to my room. All right. Put my oxygen on. I'm hacking when I call, and it hurts. You know what I mean? Ah. 30 pounds for NordVPN, 30 euros for NordVPN is pretty good. I actually have to renew my NordVPN. Uh, not looking forward to that because I'm expired. And, uh, end of January, it expires. You guys seen Venom? Venom was amazing. When did you see it? <laughs> I downloaded it. Oh, I gotta see it. You'll like it. Venom was absolutely amazing. They did a good job on that. Venom's my buddy. There's my Venom. On the perch by the door. That's my Venom. <laughs> How do you like the Mercury X? Have you used it yet? 
Uh, so I could download TV shows and movies without getting yelled at by my ISP. <laughs> I bet them. Into this venom. Well, that looks interesting. Ooh, a new Resident yeah. Evil movie. Uh, they already have the Matrix movie online. <laughs> Are you serious? It's already available for download. Oh my god. Alright, right, let's bring up the the VPN. Did you uh, just bite me? Did you just bite me? How do you like it? Yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> Having a part arrive broken. Where is the, is it a different window? There it is. I want that one, I want that one, I want that one, and I want that one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll just grab all four of those. <laughs> uh, you can look up Yiffy. So YTS.MX. How big is this? So snatch up those four movies. Any other new ones that I'm interested in? Uh, I don't see it here yet. Was it good? Uh, I it's I guess it's kind of a hoarding addiction of mine. I have um I have multiple ten terabyte hard drives that I store all my movies and TV shows on. So, I I, I like the idea of having them downloaded because now I don't have to use any more of my bandwidth. You know, they're two gigabyte downloads. Uh, these should be two gigabytes. It's actually not telling me how yeah. 2.72 to 1.9, 1 1.7. So this way, I know, for example, right here, I'm going to use 8 gigabytes of my bandwidth. That's it. Now I can play that movie on any screen I want, on any device I want, and I'm not going to use any more of my bandwidth. Because remember, we only get 1.25 terabytes, and then they want to charge you more. And when you're when you're when you're doing the kind of downloading I do, you can wipe out 1.2 terabytes real fast. Oh, the down speeds are pretty slow. Two megabits. Usually I get like 30 megabits. Uh, let's see. The other site is, I think it's rarbg.to. That is not what I asked you to do. So let's see if Ghostbusters is available here. 1.25 terabyte a month, correct. Most of the time, I'm nowhere near that. But if I get on a downloading binge, I could wipe that out real fast. I've downloaded 54 gigabytes over my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't see Ghostbusters. Probably have to wait until it's streaming somewhere before somebody can get a copy of it. I might as well check and see if any of my programs are available. So, for example, Prodigy. Uh, still only episode 5. So, 
They've only done five episodes of Star Trek Prodigy. That's kind of annoying. Uh, no, probably not. That sounds like a horror movie. And I'm just... I, I get bored with horror movies. Now, Michelle, she loves horror movies. She eats that stuff up. So, rarbg.to. That's... Uh, let me give you a link to that. R-A-R-B-G.T-O. That's where I get my TV shows and some movies. Be careful. Some people on here are psychotic. They'll post like a 70 gigabyte Blu-ray raw rip. And you'll be wondering, what's taking so long? 70 gigabytes! <laughs> <laughs> so you got you gotta watch the file size of whatever you get, and then the other site is yts. dot mx. Let's go to trending all the Matrix movies. Uh, I don't see Ghostbusters yet. What is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, it's a new movie. Uh, let's see here. Released from prison after serving a violent crime. Re-enter society. Refuses to forgive her past. Severe judgment. She played... She was called Home. Finding her sister. Okay, yeah, social drama. That is... That movie. I'll, I'll grab it. Why not? For some reason, that download is really slow. Probably because a lot of people are hitting them. Now, the thing I like about YTS is that um, most of the movies are right around 2 or 3 gigabytes. Most of them being 2 gigabytes or less. Um, something like The Matrix is longer, so it's going to be a little bit bigger. But that allows you to um, have a consistent file size. And Bullock is good, so you know I'll give it a shot. She's in it. <laughs> That's good. And there is porn on on um on um raw BG, so be careful. Dune Drifter. That looks like it might be interesting. <coughs> the Calculator. That looks good, but it's Russian, which means it's not going to be in English, and I don't do subtitles. I personally hate Russian movies. Uh, the Russians are fucking annoying because they tend to like sci-fi and they tend to make good sci-fi, but none of it's in English. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs>
but it's really annoying because um, the the Russian science fiction tends to be pretty damn good. Like it tends to be pretty awesome, but um, they very rare. I can't. It's just my brain is not wired for languages. It's I try. I took three years of German and I can remember two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> um, it took me uh, it took me like s seven months of hardcore practice to get five words per minute Morse code for my ham radio technician license before they had one where you had no code required and um, I forgot all of it it's it's just well if it gets dubbed yes I don't know if it's because of the way my brain works or if it's because of me only having one eye but I have a lot of problems with subtitles. Um, subtitles are very difficult for me because what happens is I either watch the movie and I don't read the subtitles, which means I have no idea what they're saying, or I read the subtitles, but I don't watch the movie, so I have no idea what happened. And so I'm constantly going back, going back, going back to either read what I missed or see what I missed. And the worst is when I do both. So some parts I watch but don't read, and some parts I read but I don't watch, and the movie just ends up being a jumbled mess. And it's um like uh, Especha Kleiner Deutsch, Du bist ein Dummkopf. It's about it. <laughs> um. So it's it's very. It's just the way my brain works. So maybe it's a vision thing because of the one eye. I I can't. I can't watch a movie and read the subtitles at the same time, which makes subtitles particularly annoying to me. I, I just, it doesn't work. The The movie ceases to be enjoyable. I gain no pleasure out of it. I, I don't, I miss half the damn movie because I'm reading some of it and I'm watching some of it. Subtitles just don't work. It's just the way my brain and my eyes work. Subtitles just suck. <laughs> and it sucks when you have an anime you want to watch so bad, but it's only in subtitles. Uh. And I did good in German. I, I got A's and B's the whole class, all, all three years, but the retention is zero. I'm just, I'm very, very bad with languages, and I don't know why. I'm going to try because I want to learn Spanish. Um, you know, 75% of the people in my state speak Spanish. So I want to learn Spanish. It's, it, not only would it be nice, it would be awesome to be able to speak the native language. But um, it would it, be respectful. But it would also be, it'd be awesome to be able to speak another language. So I'm going to try to learn Spanish. Yeah, I bet when I when I went to see Yuki Shu at the um the the Asian Harvest Moon Festival in Los Angeles right after 9/11, so I was able to do it really cheap. Um, they wanted me to say something, and I didn't want to say it because I didn't know what they wanted me to say. <laughs> it's like I can't confirm what that is. I'm not saying it <laughs> for just that reason. Uh, I am a vegetable. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I am a vegetable. <laughs> Interesting. I know, but Spanish is useful. The people around me speak it. And my hope is, well, because, well, like, learning German is useless. When am I going to use German to show off to people on the YouTube channel? Oh, I can speak a couple sentences of German. <laughs> it's not useful to me. You know, but Spanish or Japanese would be useful to me. Um, Japanese would be useful because I like watching anime. And Spanish would be useful because I, watch, uh, I live in an area where most people speak Spanish. So. Latinum SCL. What's that? Are you Ferengi? Gold press latinum. <laughs> you know the Ferengi in their latinum. <laughs> it's 
So I figure a language that I could actually use locally will have a better chance of sticking. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to try. <sighs> So what are you guys doing for the holidays? Exactly. Use it or lose it. I very much believe in that. Asterix comics? Google Translator. <laughs> Is Asterix the the white line drawing characters? Isn't it Russian? And um you know it's mostly action kind of stuff? Let's see. A S T Probably. Oh no, I've never seen this before. Asterix the Gull, Asterix the Legionary, Obelix, Caesar's Gift. Talk about this stuff. What's the matter, baby? Come here. You want some petting? I'll pet you. You good boy. Uh, yes. The kind of. Um, this is not what I'm thinking of, but I can clearly tell that what I'm thinking of is based on this. Um, there's a guy who makes... Um, I don't even know how to find it, but they're black and white line drawings that are animated, and um, they're it's clearly Russia. It's Russian in nature. It seems Russian, and um, but it's a ton of fun. Hey, now we're getting some bandwidth, 10 megabits. Yeah, they're kind of like Vikings, yeah. He makes his own sound effects, you know, swoosh, you know, makes his own sound effects kind of stuff. You can tell it's somebody making the sounds. It's a lot of fun. You're going to try to print a doc on Windows. What's that mean? Like a Word document? Is that what you're talking about? A Word document? Why would that be a problem? Are they different now? I haven't printed a Word doc in years, but are they different now that makes them more difficult? I mean, you just file print.
What is this? Atomic Eden. Eh, it looks boring. Uh, the ones I watch, they don't tend to talk. At least I don't remember them talking too much. I just don't use Office. I got lucky on some of those stocks I was getting. So my my Robin Hood's up to 1300, which you're not going to be able to see probably. Let me unplug it. So I'm up to 1300 on Robin Hood. I can't take anything out for like another year because if you if you take anything out in less than 2 years, the taxes are higher. But um I'm um, doing good on the AMC. I got lucky. I bought that for three dollars a share. Now it's worth thirty dollars a share. <laughs> so I got lucky on that. And then the Weeble. <laughs> Go away. Thank you. And this one's doing okay. I still have my four GME. I'm not letting them go. I got my four GME. Um, I'm up 22% on GME, so I'm happy with that. And the, again, the AMC is doing well. You know, I paid three dollars a share for AMC, and so I got another 800 in AMC on here. So as long as I don't touch it for two years, I get very low taxes to take it out. The rest of them are freebies you got for signing up. So I have, you know, one RF and one GNW. They're only worth like $8 and $21. Cool. But um, I got the play. I got play. Um, during the pandemic, someone suggested buying play. That's Dave and Buster's. And I did. I got 13 shares of it, and it's up a, what, 300%? <laughs> so I, I spent well under $100, and I got $499 now. So I was like, cool. <laughs> Except I can't touch it, because you get taxed out the ass if you touch it. So it has to sit there. I'm, I'm kind of hoping it doubles, and then I could pay off some, you know, some of that EIDL loan that I got. That'd be nice. <laughs> That'd be nice to pay off some debt. But I've just got to be patient. I don't even look at it. I log into it like once every month or something like that. And then I just just ignore it. <laughs> uh, I understand that's the best way to deal with that kind of stuff. Just pretend it's not there. <laughs> if it goes down, so what? It'll come back up. I mean, it just, just ignore it. <laughs> As long as it's all trending up, you're fine. Just ignore it. <laughs> ah, Matrix is downloaded. Resident Evil is downloaded. Now we're downloading Rumble and the Unforgivable. So, 
I mean, a lot of those I should have bought more of, but I can't. I ain't got the money. So I'm just, I'm happy with what I got. I'm not losing anything, so that's good. Ow. That sucks. Yeah. The only bad one I have uh, that I haven't made anything off of yet. Is Viacom. I thought Viacom would be a good bet. I only bought three. And it cost me next to nothing. Um, I think it was like $9 a share or something like that. But it's actually gone down. <laughs> it's at negative 34%. That's the only one that's really gone down, is um, Viacom. What are NFTs? So, NFT. Non-fungible token. Oh, so like Dogecoin and Bitcoin and stuff like that. Ah, uh, they're pyramid schemes. They're all pyramid schemes. The people who are in first are going to bail when everybody else jumps on the bandwagon, then everybody loses. They're, they're pyramid schemes. I have Dogecoin just because it's funny. <laughs> it, it's hilarious, so why not? <laughs> you can't. Um, the market is a living thing. It is so complicated. Um, it's a, It's a living thing. It is beyond our ability to predict. Um, the reason GameStop did anything and partially AMC did anything is because um, the big boys who were invested in them cheated. They broke the rules. They did things illegal that they weren't supposed to do and somebody figured out they were doing that. And they took advantage of that. That's why GameStop and AMC happened. Because those guys broke the rules. And somebody got, oh, oh, you broke the rules. I'm going to grab you by your balls. And they did. <laughs> um, but you, you can't make that happen. And, and these guys won't make that same mistake again. It has to do with shorting and fabricating fictional stocks. Meaning they were generating stock value that legally didn't exist. And um, someone figured out that they did that. Um, basically they created more shares than actually existed. And um, as, long as, as long as they can sell off before that happens, before the count occurs, they get away with it. And someone figured out what they were doing. So um, that's what happened there. And of course nothing came of it. Of course, no big guys got slapped. No, nobody went to jail. Nobody got fined. Not seriously, because you know, you know, the rules for thee, not for me. <laughs> the the whole stock market is such a scam. It's it's wow. What are you gonna do though, right? So it's not that anybody caused a stir. It's that um. It became popular enough that enough people bought the stocks that they couldn't erase all of their fictional stocks fast enough. So they had to sit on them. And of course, when you sit on a short, you have to pay interest on that short. And um, so uh, one of the companies was bankrupted. If I remember correctly, one of the companies was bankrupted because of it. And... Um, so, yeah. <laughs> they played with fire and somebody figured out, ooh, yeah, they got some fire there. Let's put some gas on the flame. <laughs> that was funny. That was cute. Of course, what will actually happen is they'll pass rules, rules for thee, not for me, that will make it impossible for um, day traders to do that again and allow these filthy rich people to continue to fuck everybody over. Wow. He did it twice! Oh my god. 
you know, you got to give those kind of people credit, though. I mean, there's a certain level of genius there. Uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's a certain level of skill involved in that. Oh, NFTs. Okay, that's different. I thought NFT was just, um, coins. But, um, no, it looks like NFTs are something that they're associating with digital files, pictures, videos, and audio. I'm not sure what that is. I, I don't know much about that. I just read what an NFT, a non-fungible token is. So it's a way of securing files. It's a way of, um, validating the identity of a file or the, um, the heritage, the, um, ownership of a file, if I remember correctly. Okay. Look above. What are you doing? Yeah, I see you. Uh-huh. Making a mess as usual. <laughs> huh? You climbing all over everything? Is that fun for you? Mm-hmm. Yes. You're such a good cat. Yes, you are. You're a good boy. <laughs> exactly. That it's a way of tracking the original. It's like kind of like a, I guess like a digital ID code, digital watermark or something. So that's completely different than what I was thinking. The the coins are a scam. They're a pyramid scheme. This is something totally different. There's still a guy. Is it, Was it in the UK? It might be in the UK. Isn't there still a guy looking for his hard drive that has like $10 billion in Bitcoin on it or something like that? Or $10 million in Bitcoin on it? No. Most of them are. Some are just memes like, like Dogecoin. It's just for fun. As far as I'm concerned. I have like 600 Dogecoin. It's not worth anything, but, you know, it's fun. What the hell? But, um, I actually have a Bitcoin, or had a Bitcoin. I think I had, like, 0.89 Bitcoin. Um, something like that. It was just under one. Back in the early days when it first started, you know, my, um, my Pentium computer was mining it. <laughs> you know, back in the early, early, early days of Bitcoin. And, of course, I threw it away not thinking anything of it and of course I'm kicking myself in the ass now for throwing it away <laughs> oh it's, it's gone by now probably because they're looking for it so I feel bad for that guy man that much money I mean that, that's life altering I mean that's life altering Jesus and if that truly gets lost, it's lost forever. There's no way to recover it. You know, except to find it. And whatever hard drive is on is probably bad by now. So that's a pity. Yeah, I don't have any Bitcoin. I can't even afford one. <laughs> oh, I have these little copper coins that say Bitcoin on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like actual little copper coins as a Bitcoin. <laughs> How is he getting NASA to look for it? You can't look for a Bitcoin as far as I know. If you mean look for the hard drive, you can't. It's buried by now. It'll be under, you know, several meters of other garbage that's been dumped since then. You know, this has been going on for years. But I feel bad for the guy, man. To know, to know you have, to know you had that much money within your grasp. That would hurt. That would hurt a lot. I'm boosted a little too much. Huh. Man, so much money. <laughs> I 
What are you going to do? Nothing you can do about it. Hey, you know what I found is pretty good? Oh, wow, that sucks. Um, I found out that um, I tried something the other day. It was it was actually kind of good. You know, I got the little K-cup coffee machine. And, um... Um... And I got the, you know, the packs of hot chocolate. So... I mixed a K-cup with the hot chocolate packet. And it wasn't that bad. It was pretty good. I actually kind of needed a little bit of creamer. It was okay without the creamer, but creamer would have made it better. But it was actually surprisingly good. Yeah, without the password and hashtag and whatnot, you can't use it. That's why they sell those little titanium cards that you put your hashtag number on and stuff like that. That that's your password. <laughs> oh, that would be a dick move. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, all downloaded. Rumble, Unforgivable, and Dune Drifter. Oh, um, probably next Wednesday, I got the new P3, uh, the Micro P3 Pro. It's supposed to be like a 5-in-1 iDex printer, so we will be doing that next Wednesday. It's in the trunk of my car. Just got it yesterday. So we're going to play with that next week. That'll be fun. And, uh... <sighs> yeah, see, the, the, the Bitcoin itself is not on the hard drive. The private key is on the hard drive. The Bitcoin is in the blockchain. The private key accesses that chunk of the blockchain, if I remember correctly. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Uh, yeah, it should be. I don't, I don't see any reason not to. Yeah, the 29th. There's no reason not to. So the, the whole thing that he needs is that private key. That's what he needs off that hard drive. And then he can access his chunk of the, the Bitcoin blockchain. <laughs> oh, and I make a raft. I keep all the rafts. So I have a bunch of these little raft chunks. I keep them because they're good for mixing and spreading epoxy and stuff like that. They're great little stir sticks. So it actually doesn't go to waste. Yeah, I got like a small handful of them. You know, the ones that the ones that don't break. So I keep them to use them as little epoxy or CA slurry um, stir sticks. So that works pretty good. Ah, uh, here's the yellow one. So far, this one's proven to be the the best PLA so far. It's it's. It's strong. You can see it does not bend very easily. Um, this one has been strong enough to actually turn the key. So it actually works. <laughs> hey, so we're out here. We're going to run down to Costco. I'm going to grab that... Um, I also want to get more of the coffee boxes. You know how, um, actually, you know when you get like a case of vegetables, it comes in a little cardboard skid, and the cans fit inside that. 
I like those boxes because um sometimes the smaller or less rounded things like um like this sits nicely on the shelf but something like this doesn't it tends to tip over because of the gaps between the wires and um so um they have um um pinion coffee new mexico pinion coffee and i've never tried it yet too expensive but um the cardboard trays they come in are the exact size of the shelving so it's perfect so i want to grab some more of those What's your opinion on that? I'll give you an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I still haven't. Uh, I haven't gotten any nuts out of my trees. Maybe I don't know if they're not mature enough, or maybe they're not the right kind of tree. But I thought I'd be able to get pine nuts out of my trees, and I, I haven't seen any yet. So I'm not sure what the deal is on that. Maybe they're short-lived, and the animals are eating them, and I missed. I don't know. But I haven't fouled any pine nuts yet. I was kind of hoping to get some out of it. Yeah, I know. They're inside the cones. There's no cones. Uh, that's what I mean. There's, there's no cones. <laughs> At least I haven't seen any. So I'm wondering if, you know, i got to check more often. Maybe the animals are getting them first. Uh, not that I'm aware of. They, I've had no contact with them. So I'm wondering if um, they associated me with um, Naomi, and when they drop Naomi, they drop me. I don't know. Um, they didn't renew her contract, so she moved on to, a, uh, I guess, some other business. I don't know anything about her now because she got mad at me for some stupid, silly reason and blocked me. <laughs> like, okay. I'm not going to argue with you. Not worth my time. Well, with how long he's been going on about it, it probably did exist, or at least he thinks it exists. So, who knows? What are you going to do? Yeah, but Naomi and Creality don't work together anymore. Yeah, I agree. Like, I think some of the changes they made in the Ender 2 are a regression. Like, there are, there are things that I would change back to the way it was on the original Ender 2. Like, um, I want the spool holder on top. I don't care if it's less efficient. I want the spool holder on top. Because one of the things I liked about the Ender 2 was how little space it took. And you have the spool holder sticking out the side, you are taking more space now. But, uh, you know, people are fickle. I mean, just... It's, it is what it is. You make do, you move on. I got the glue in today, too, so I'll be able to start gluing these together. I might also put a thread, like take some sewing thread, wrap it around this, 
to make sure these metal plates can't pop out. What? Bought an ivory straw and had it monogrammed with my initials. Uh, I don't get it who's been farting. What are you talking about? Yeah, I figure I figure they have to be pretty big. So I was like, how do I miss them? So I'm wondering, maybe my trees are too young. Maybe they're not making them yet. I don't know. Or maybe I just didn't look enough, and the animals got them first. There's not much food around here, so any available food is going to go away pretty quick. Did he eat all of his food? Nope. Oh wow. So they're they're like that big. There's a guy on TikTok who's making a um a map of the United States and he's making each state out of a piece of wood from that state so like he did New Mexico out of a piece of um, pinion wood you know because that's the state tree for New Mexico pinion tree pretty cool Got all the Christmas cards sent out. So I got all those Christmas cards sent out. These are little stickers to seal the envelope. So got some pretty nice cards. Got these from Costco of all places. They're nice and heavy duty. They're foil or, or glitter. You know, nice simple cards, but nice thick envelopes. You know, nice thick envelopes. You know, real nice. So I sent out 32 cards yesterday. I love sending out Christmas cards. <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> Ran out of stamps. I had to buy like 10 stamps. I got to find. I got like 300 stamps here somewhere. I just got to find them. I bought enough stamps so I could send out Christmas cards for 10 years. I got them real cheap. <laughs> Cuz Christmas cards unless they're funky uh, they can be. They do work. My the one that I liked was the CRX and the um, the A twenty T. Um, those were my favorites of the two into one. Um, um, the problem with two into one is that they can clog. So what happens is you have to purge filament, retract the filament, and then insert the new filament. So you're always pulling out one color, putting in the other color, pulling out another color, putting in the other color. And the problem is, um, depending on the filament really, if the filament strings when it's pulled out, if it leaves a string going into the hot end, that 
it's possible for that string to be thick enough to jam the new color when it tries to go in, and then it can't go in. That can happen. But, in my experience, it was pretty reliable. As long as you made sure you purged forward first before retracting the new color, the old color, because um, um, like when I tell you how to change filament, you know, I tell you, you push, 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 then pull smoothly. That's to avoid creating that string. Um, as long as you avoid creating that string, you should be okay. Uh, otherwise, they do work. You know something else I wondered? Do I have to put the bidding on both sides? Could I just have a one-sided key? I mean, the, I bet you it only reads one side of the key, and they do it on both sides, so that no matter which way you insert the key, it still works. But if I did it one-sided, that means the key would only work one way, but the key would be easier to print and it would be stronger. Huh. I might have to try that. But then again, the part that would be stronger is the part that doesn't matter. Because this this is not the part that's being torqued. It's the interface. That's, that's the part that's being torqued. When you turn the key... Well, you're going to have to email me your address if you want me to send you a card. I mean, I can't just... It didn't work. So you got to send me your address. Just remember, once you send me your address... I know where my next meal is. <laughs> then I could begin stalking you. But you're probably not local. You're in the UK, aren't you? I actually almost used an entire pack of cards. I only got that much left out of that 40 pack. That's my favorite. I love that one. I just think that's beautiful. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got eight cards left. So if you guys want a Christmas card, send me your address and I'll send you a Christmas card. Well, I don't. Can I send a Christmas card to the UK with a regular stamp? I have a feeling that wouldn't work with a regular stamp. You know, I think it would cost a lot more to send a Christmas card to the UK. In the US, I know it's just one stamp. Where are those stamps? I just got some coffee stamps. <laughs> Actually, they're still in the car. Uh, I know I can send a card anywhere in the U.S. with one stamp. As long as it's a regular card, nothing special, um, I know you can do that. But as far as, um, I wonder if Aunt Carol ever replied.
Nope, she hasn't replied yet. Poo. Wow! A whole boneless beef ribeye. 22 pounds. $451. That's ridiculous. What the hell? Wow. Dollar fifteen, so probably two stamps. To send uh a greeting card. I don't know why people post stupid memes like this. You're offered three billion dollars, but you can never buy alcohol again. So I pay my personal butler to go buy the alcohol. Because with $3 billion, I'll have a personal butler. <laughs> I mean, it's just... <laughs> Of course it would be 2.1 stamps. <laughs> you, you wouldn't have to. It specifically says you would not buy it. So you just pay your butler to buy it. <laughs> Plus, I don't drink alcohol, so that's an easy one for me. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see them accept that. <laughs> this guy posts some funny stuff. Do you get it? <laughs> That's good. I just find that kind of stuff funny. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not too... It's not too hard to make me giggle. <laughs> Has anybody tried these guys yet? Ninety bucks for ten kilograms? Now that's kind of cool. If you live in an environment where that's practical. It would certainly keep the bees happy. I 
I saw that. That little snowflake TIE fighter. Just the download link didn't work, and I've been too lazy to download all the individual files. But yeah, I want to grab that. That looks pretty cool. Oh, by the way, um, if you have a micro center near you, they have a coupon for $100 off for first-time shoppers for the Ender 3 Pro. So you get the Ender 3 Pro for $99. Uh, let me see if it's still active. be going to run there it is and I just got to find it not that one not that one not that one not that one I still use thingiverse there we go Uh, looks like it... Ah, oh, the deal is expired. It's gone. Oh, poo. Yeah, it expired. They have a 128 gigabyte flash drive offer now. <laughs> That's a pity. Well, the problem is, I don't like the idea of Prusa controlling it. You know, Prusa has a vest. I like Prusa. I like their printers. I love their filament. But having one company control that, who has a vested interest in controlling it for their own purposes, I'm just iffy about that. I mean, so far he's given me no reason to distrust him, but, you know, what about five years from now, ten years from now? I don't know, it just bothers me a little bit. Maybe it's dumb, maybe it shouldn't bother me. Because he's never given a reason to be distrusted, but it just bugs me. Yes, but they don't make consumer 3D printers. They are divested of... Um, they, they, do, they have no um, incentive to direct you toward one specific printer or another. You know, the, they're an industrial company that inherited Thingiverse, and it's just too valuable to throw away. <laughs> Talking about Micro Center, that's funny. <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. I've actually never been to a Micro Center. They, ha they had them... So even though Thingiverse is owned by MakerBot, there's no conflict of interest. Because MakerBot doesn't really sell consumer printers. So Thingiverse is very open and very agnostic. It's like, um, it's like neutral ground. It's like the neutral zone. <laughs> Ah, oh, that feels good. Ah. What else can they do? I mean, you're a company, somebody hacks you, and shit gets stolen. What else can you do? 
You know, they put almost they they put the minimum necessary into Thingiverse because they don't want it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to deal with it. But it's too valuable to get rid of. <laughs> you can't really profit from it, so they're pouring resources into it. Um, most of the um, you know, they they don't want to pour resources into it because they can't profit from it. But they don't want to get rid of it because it's too valuable. So it's 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 weird. You know what's scary today is when you see stuff like this. You know, I mean, this is this is fiction. This is full of lies that show that the person I'm not going to I'm not going to disclose who posted it, but it shows that the person who posted it has no understanding of science and medicine, like not even a basic understanding. In, and you know that's scary. Merry Christmas, Dragon Drone. If the motor works fine and the connections are good, then it's your main board. If it's the main board, you can't save that. Your cheapest solution is to replace the stepper motor just to be sure. Um, make sure the if one of the wires in the four pin wires, if one of those wires comes out, one of the phase loops gets disconnected, it'll stop working and sometimes it'll just sit there and go and it'll jitter back and forth. So make sure all four wires are working, all four wires are actually connected. Um, I believe the stepper for the extruder is actually different than the X and Y, so you can't just swap them. Um, if it is a main board, then yes, you could just swap the main board. You're going to want to swap it with one that came from an Ender 5, unless you know how to um, do the firmware. Because remember, the Ender 5 is a little bit different than the... Um, than, um, like an Ender 3, it's, it's not quite the same. Oh, it's in Albuquerque, so it'll be there tomorrow. Look at this. Jesus. Remember when computers cost that much? <laughs> oh, man. 20 megahertz, 386 with 2 megabytes of RAM. Man, I, I remember when my I had my... 486 SX50 with 4 megabytes of RAM and I was so excited to finally be able to afford to upgrade that to 16 megabytes of RAM. <laughs> I remember that day. I was so excited I was going to be able to get 16 megabytes of RAM. <laughs> oh my god. $8,500. Monitor and mouse not included. So you still had to buy a monitor and a mouse. <laughs> oh my god. Mm.
Ah, uh, nah. I think we're hitting a point of diminishing returns now. You can now get you can now get decent enough gaming PCs for under a thousand thousand dollars. <laughs> nice. Yep, I've done that. Ram stick keychains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, had a, uh, I had a tie that was made of a PCB board. So like a chunk of a motherboard. A very subjective descent. What's that? You're not talking about the game descent, are you? Yeah, they keep advertising these new crystal-based cat litters. And, of course, the video goes away as soon as you move away from the window. Yeah, until you realize that you're going to pay 40 bucks per cat per month. It's like, I pay $15 for both cats. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you, you can't replace the litter until, you know, um, you're equitable in cost. You know, rich people can afford that. Oh, decent enough PC. Okay. Like, even this little Acer here it would be a, an adequate gaming machine. I mean, sure, if you run if you want to run full spec at 4K, it's not going to do it. But it'll do basically anything you want at 1080p. I mean, it's, it's good enough. Wait a minute, did you say cat litter DRM? Okay, I've seen this before. What do you mean by DRM? Oh, yeah. That's common. So you can't refill it yourself. Yum, yum, yum. The twenty eighty TI.
Um, what? Two thousand dollars. $2,000 for a fucking graphics card? Over my dead body. That's lunacy. What the hell? You've got to be kidding me. Sixteen hundred dollars. Yeah, sixteen hundred and forty nine dollars the cheapest price. That's ridiculous. Oh here's one for fifteen ninety two. Wow. There's one on Alibaba for eight hundred bucks, but you no way to know if it's real. Well, thankfully stereoscopic doesn't do shit for me because I only got one eye. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're literally running the game twice. You're you're creating every pixel twice. You're doubling the um the performance of, uh, problem there. That's ridiculous. There's some of them going as high as thirty six hundred dollars. That's just insanity. I don't know. I believe it is the same main board. You just have to flash the firmware. So worst case, you might have to first um, JTAG a bootloader onto the um, board. You know, use an Arduino to put the bootloader on there so you can then um, change the firmware. It, it should be possible. I've never done it, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. That's insane. Well, here's a um, here's an i7 gaming desktop with 32 gigs of RAM and a 2080 Ti 11 gigabyte built in for a thousand dollars, and it's buy it now. Here's the um, the number, you know, then just take the card out of the computer. Oh no, it says 1060. If you ah, it, it jumps to $2000 if you pick the 2080. I hate when they show the lowest price but display the highest spec. That should be illegal. If you're going to show the $1000 price, you should show the $1000 spec. You shouldn't be allowed to show the lowest spec but display the or the lowest price and display the highest price. The highest spec. That shouldn't be legal. I hate that. Jesus. That's ridiculous. Here's an interesting one for you guys. Maybe you maybe you guys can help me out. <laughs> Give me some advice on what I can do. The battery in my car is going bad. Holy shit. 
the battery in my electric car is going bad. Um, most likely what's going on is some of the cells are undervolting. There, so the BMS is cutting out the undervolting cells to avoid you know things catching on fire. And so the pack voltage changes and I lose range. Um, no, he said he sold it to somebody local. Um, so right now my car has a range of 50 miles. <laughs> <laughs> I can only go 50 miles. About 47 miles. I took it to the dealer. If you're okay, if the pack is dying, the pack is still under warranty. They charged me 170 bucks just to tell me they have to do more diagnostics. Here's the problem. They basically put a shotgun to my head, and I can't tell if the shotgun's loaded. It's seven hundred and twenty-five dollars to drop the battery, to inspect and plug in inside, to see what's going on. Now, of course, if whatever is wrong is warranted, I get a new battery. Um, the problem is they're already setting the groundwork to deny my warranty claim. Um, not a hybrid; it's a pure electric car. Um, they're already setting the groundwork to, to deny my warranty claim. The technician claims that they're, they see what could indicate rodent damage. The problem is, if they pull the battery from the car and they find rodent damage, they cannot put the battery back in the car. The battery has to be replaced. That's $8,000. I don't have that. So, if they pull the battery and it's not covered by warranty and something prevents them from putting the battery back in, I'm now stuck with a worthless junk pile of metal and battery. If it's rodent damage, I'm okay. My car insurance comprehensive coverage will cover rodent damage. The problem is, what if they can't put the battery back in, but it's also not rodent damage and not covered under warranty? Well, now, again, I'm stuck with a paperweight of a car that I can't use because they won't put the battery back in. Um, it'll be, uh, oh, yeah, depends on which Ender 3. The original Ender 3 would be an 8-bit. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's a, if there's no rodent damage and the battery's bad, Nissan will replace the battery. If there is rodent damage, my car insurance will replace the battery. But if it's a third option, if it's something that prevents them, they won't tell me. They won't fucking tell me. They can't tell me until they drop the battery. So I've got to spend $700 to drop the battery and hope it's not something that prevents them from putting it back in. And then I go to jail. <laughs> uh, that's the problem. They, they cannot tell me which it will be, what it will be. And I can't do it unless I know which it will be. Because, I, I mean, right now I could sell the car for $12,000. But the problem is I can't replace it for $12,000. <laughs> and if they pull the battery and can't put the battery back in, I lose the ability to sell the car. <laughs> you see the problem? Well, that's just it. The factory warranty's expired. And apparently the 7-year, 94,000-mile warranty that I have on the car is... um. No, you don't understand. They have lawyers. I don't. They will be holding my car and charging me to store it there with the battery pack separated from it, and there will be nothing I could do about it. <laughs> uh, you could buy an old, you know, first generation Leaf for 5K, but you can't buy a 30 kilowatt modern Leaf for 5K. They're selling for they're selling for sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars. 
So basically, uh, I have three options. I can gamble on the pack removal. I can't even afford the $700. I mean, I could put it on my credit card, of course, but how would I make the payments? You know, the payments on that are going to be 50, 60 bucks a month. That's more than I have. Um, not counting interest. Yes, it's going to be like 70, 75 bucks a month in, just in payments. And, um, well, that's the problem, though, is they have to pull the battery to determine if it's under warranty. The problem is if... I know that. <laughs> At least I, I can check the individual cells. <laughs> Why can't they? Uh, apparently the, the factory warranty on the car expired like two months ago. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the five years was August. <laughs> so uh, even though I bought the car to them a year ago for this problem, and he said there was nothing wrong. <laughs> uh, there is no second dealership. I'm in the middle of fucking New Mexico. <laughs> There's no other Nissan. And, and if I take it to another Nissan dealership, I'll have to pay another $172 for another battery examination for them to probably tell me the exact same thing. Because I can't afford that. You have to drop the battery, take it apart, replace the bad cells. <laughs> uh, well, the people I trust are 2,000 miles away in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Remember, I just moved here. Uh, so now my choices so far are keep the car and hope it doesn't get worse. That's probably a bad idea. How? How do you make sure? <laughs> well, we got you have to understand the, the 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 company is going to do whatever it takes to protect themselves. They're going to take the path that results in them not carrying liability because remember, I didn't buy the car from them. So they're dealing with a warranty claim from another dealership. And um uh. <laughs> The problem is you'd have to drop the battery to get up there. And I don't have the capacity to do that and plus that's a crime. That's called insurance fraud. I don't want to go to jail, especially now that we're publicly talking about this in a live stream <laughs> that their lawyers will subpoena. <laughs> uh, we got to understand that for most of us, we don't have contracts. You see, when, 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 when you sign for this kind of stuff, it's, it's not a legal contract. It's a legal set of terms and conditions. See, a contract is a two-way agreement. You have no input into this. You don't get a say. So. Yeah, but buying the car without a battery results in you getting nothing for it. It's, it's technically a contract, but it's not really a contract because you don't have any power. Unless you can, uh, unless you have a lawyer on retainer who can argue for you, you don't really have power. Yeah, I know. I have leave. I've, I've, I've got the leaf spy thing, and I gotta find my little dongle and plug it in. I've gotta make the card error again, so I gotta take it up the mountain. You know, put it under a high load so it errors again. Uh, nothing's happening with that. We're waiting for T Tab to do their thing. It's it's now a waiting process for the trademark office to do whatever it is they do well that's just it if I sell the car I can sell it for much more than it's worth right now I can get 11 000, Carvana will give me eleven thousand eight hundred dollars for the car the problem is well first of all 
you know, 2600 of that immediately goes to paying off the car because I still owe 2600 bucks. So I'd have about 10 grand left. I can't go buy another car for 10 grand. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist because the inflated used car market means my car is worth more than it should be. But it also means the replacement car I would buy is also worth more than it should be. So there's no net gain there. The only way for me to achieve a net gain there would be to sell the car, hold the money until the supply chain shortage settles down in a year or two, and car prices come back down to normal in a year or two, and then use that ten grand to go buy another car. That, that creates two very large problems. One, I have to somehow hold on to that ten grand without spending any of it. That's going to be very hard to do, especially if any kind of expense comes up. Uh, number two is that I will no longer have an electric car, which means I will have to drive the gasoline car, which I still owe 3600 on. The whole point of buying that Kia Soul was that I'm not going to use it very much. So I'm hoping to get 7 to 10 years maintenance-free, basically, out of the car, besides my normal you know, maintenance. Changing the oil, greasing the joints, stuff like that. <coughs> You know, no major repairs. And that is predicated on not using the car. Only using it when I need to. But if I no longer have the electric car, I will now have to use that car for my daily driving needs. Well, some part of the prices will come back down. Used cars can't maintain this kind of value forever. You know, the, the, the used car prices right now are predicated on supply and demand. People cannot get new cars, so used cars are being pushed up in value. Once people are able to buy new cars again, then the pressure on the price of used cars will come off, and those prices will return to normal. I mean, there's no way in hell... My seven thousand dollar Nissan Leaf is going to stay worth twelve thousand dollars forever. That's just not going to happen. And um, but it's just like, it's like, do you have to screw me every which way possible? Can't you work with me? I I need an assurance that the only reason you won't be able to put that battery back in is for rat damage, because that I know will be covered. This is not inflation. The, what we're seeing right now is not inflation. What we're seeing right now is price gouging. Price gouging is not the same as inflation. With used cars, it's not price gouging. That's supply and demand. That's a temporary shortage in one market causing an inflation in another market. When you fix the shortage in that market, you'll fix the sh inflation in this market. That's inevitable. Um... So that's not inflation, that's a, uh, a temporary shortage, supply-demand imbalance. And the other price issues that we're having in society today, they're not inflation either. They're just pure price gouging. I'm rude. <sighs> I mean, I, I could take any result... Except we can't put the battery back in and it's not covered. Any other result I can handle. If the battery's bad, Nissan pays for it. If there's rodent damage, my insurance pays for it. But is there an option three? <laughs> uh, is there an option where it's not rodent damage, it's not Nissan covered, and we can't put the battery back in the car? I can't have that option. I have to eliminate that option. Because that option results in me having nothing. <laughs> and being out $700. I mean, even if I could afford the loan to put $8,000 in it to replace the battery, that's stupid. The battery's worth more than the car. I mean, if I put a new battery in the car that's not covered under warranty, meaning I have to pay for that battery, and something else on the car breaks that I can't afford to fix, I'm stuck with a paperweight with a brand new battery. 
Fuck no. If, like, for example, if my car insurance replaces the battery, I want to keep the old battery. I can use that to power this house. <laughs> oh, my God. Because there's probably only four or five cells that are bad. When it rains, it pours. You know, it's just like, it's like cut me some slack. Cut me some break here, okay? <sighs> I don't see it, but what if they do? You know, because remember, the consequence of being wrong is my $12,000 car becomes a salvaged paperweight. I mean, <laughs> you would think so. You would think so. Uh, no, homeowners does not cover your cars. Oh, I'm, I'm almost certain the battery is bad. I mean, okay, I'm not an expert in EV packs, but I've built enough model airplanes and cars to understand how batteries work. And um, so what happens is, like, here's, here's what happened. We went down to Costco to pick up a couple water tanks. I got a couple 35-gallon water tanks. Nice deal. Um, I had 72% on the battery. Went to Wendy's right there in the same parking lot. I'm down to 68%. We head back up mountain. I only need 45% to make it up the mountain. The only reason I didn't get stuck on the side of the road is because, uh, by for whatever reason, I don't know why. Uh, they're getting ready to turn off the 3G radios. So I've been using the car's functions to get the telematics as updated as possible before I lose the 3G connection, and then I get no more updates because AT&T is taking down the 3G towers. And um, there's no way to upgrade the car. Well, technically there is, but it's not worth it. Very expensive. Um, so I happened by chance to be using the car's built-in GPS navigation system. I'm coming up the mountain. I'm doing 65 miles an hour, you know, hauling ass up the mountain. The speed limit 65. And all of a sudden, over the speakers, I hear, destination may be out of range. I'm like, what? <laughs> I look down, and the car's at 21%. It should be at, like, 40%. And the car's at 21% battery. And I'm watching it drop. 21, 20, 19, 18. What the fuck? I turn everything off. I put the four ways on and I drop the car down to 45 miles an hour. Let me tell you, that's sketchy enough as it is because the cars are passing me at 70. The speed limit is 65, but everybody's doing 70 except for the trucks. Um, so, it, well, I have no choice. It's do 45 or just pull over and wait for AAA because <laughs> I'm not making it home at the current power load. So I have to reduce the power load. I bring it down to 45, and I limp home. I get home with 3% left on the battery. Like, what the fuck happened? Where did, what happened to all my power? I had 68%. I should have gotten home with 20% left on the battery. 20, 25% left on the battery. Um, that's why I didn't even bother looking at the battery meter. Now, I plug it in. I'm doing... Uh, the Kia was blocking the driveway at the time, so I plug it into the trickle charger, the 110-volt trickle charger, which can only charge at 1.1 kilowatt hours. In two hours, the car went from 6% to 56%. Now, if you know anything about batteries and electricity at all, you know that's not possible. I only delivered 2.2 kilowatt hours to the battery, it does not have a 4.4 kilowatt hour battery. It has a 30 kilowatt hour battery. So it's not possible for me to have delivered 15 kilowatt hours over a 110 volt line in two hours. Well, if you know anything about batteries and BMS and stuff like that, you're going to understand exactly what happened, just like I understand exactly what happened. You have 92 cells in the car, okay? So there's 92 batteries inside the traction pack. The, the battery is made up of multiple cells. Each cell is an individual battery, and there's 92 of them. So it's like having 92 AA batteries. Well, a couple of those cells are mismatching, meaning all the batteries...
Um, all the batteries need to be about the same voltage. So as you charge, all the batteries charge, and as you discharge, all the batteries discharge. And they all maintain about the same level. Now, when you have the car plugged in, at the end of the charge cycle, the reason it takes so long to do that final little bit, that final 10% of charge, is because that's when it does balancing. It starts to balance the cells. If any of the cells are slightly high or slightly low, it takes care of that and it balances the cells so all the cells have the same voltage. So what's happening, when I was coming up the mountain, some of the cells in the car are bad. Probably four, five, six, seven of them. That's about the number that would need to be bad for this to happen. Um, what happens is the voltage on those cells is too low. Well, all the cells together are a battery pack. That's why we call it a traction pack. Um, each cell is technically its own battery. Um, because it's thousands of dollars I can't afford. And I void the warranty as soon as I open that back. <laughs> Um, that's, that's something that's well beyond my tools and knowledge capability. Uh, and plus, I don't have a Consult 2 system to plug the car in to reprogram it. <laughs> Once I do that. Um, so what's happening is some of the batteries are too low. And the BMS sees this. As a safety protocol, the BMS is going to terminate those cells. It's going to cut those cells out of the loop. Because if you... If you overcharge or over-discharge a cell, it could catch fire. It could damage it permanently. So to avoid creating a safety hazard, the BMS is going to be programmed to cut out those cells from the pack. Well, let's say you have a 10-volt pack, and there's a volt in each cell, and I cut out three cells. Suddenly, my pack goes from 10 volts to 7 volts. Uh, it's lost two capacity um, bars. But I'm down to, like, the equivalent of five. <laughs> the system just hasn't recognized it yet. Because <laughs> I, I can only go 47 miles. I should be able to go 85 miles, but I can only go about 47. Um, so when it cuts out those cells, the entire pack voltage suddenly drops. And voltage is how it measures pack capacity. So the system has to now suddenly recalculate everything, which is why my percentage was going <laughs> because I it, the BMS suddenly pulled cells out of the package, out of the out of the loop, and that's also why the car was able to charge from um, two percent to fifty six percent in two hours. That's because as it charged and those bad cells that were taken out of the loop synced up with the other cells as it was charging, it brought those cells back into the loop again. And that's why the pack volt, the pack capacity jumped from 6% to 56% in um, two hours because those cells came back online and became part of the pack again. Um, so it's very clear to anybody who understands batteries, that's what's happening. I have bad cells. That happens. It happens. That's what, that's what the warranty is for. And um, the problem is, well, you have two problems. One, there's, uh, no, I never took the car for surveys. Never. And, and, and I never off-roaded the car. It, it's a car. You can't do that. <laughs> On top of that, all of the locations I've gone to are too far away. I don't have the range to go to. The locations that I've gone to are way too far away. That's why I was using the minivan, the pickup truck, and now the Kia Soul. Because the electric car was unable to go to... Uh, I was able to do one of them over in Stanley. There was no off-roading. It was just normal roads. Yeah, it should last 10 to 15 years before the range becomes short enough to be unusable. I'm um, five years. So there's clearly something wrong with the battery. Some of the cells are bad. But there's two problems. One, there's very specific criteria that error conditions have to fit within in order for a warranty to activate. Um, well, they're not going to accept Leaf Spy data because that's not an authorized Nissan program. So even though that will prove it, they're not going to accept that. So what they're going to want is to drop the battery and do whatever it is that they do. Uh, well, no, the 10 to 15 years is usable years. 
you know, that's when they estimate the battery's capacity will be reduced enough to no longer be usable. That's why the warranty is um, if you lose four capacity bars within eight years, you get a new battery. Well, the problem is I don't have leverage because I don't have a lawyer and I don't have the money <laughs> to pay for it. <laughs> So, um, and you know, and, and they can just say whatever they want, and what can I do? How can I make them honor the warranty? I can't hire a lawyer. <laughs> I don't have that kind of money. That's thousands of dollars that I can't get back. Um, I don't know. It's driving me crazy. It's, it's genuinely driving me crazy. Because I know it's a warranty thing. You know, there's no question there's something wrong with the battery. And, um, but it has to meet their conditions to do that. Their conditions have to be met in order to think. And, of course, the onboard system is biased toward pretending the battery is better than it is. Because I can go 47 miles, but it still says I have 10 capacity bars. <laughs> Clearly, I don't. But that's what it says. Yeah, <laughs> and and when you take it to them, that's what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, "Well, the test says it's okay, but it's not okay. Go ahead and drive it." <laughs> but the test says it's okay. <laughs> you see what I mean? You see the catch twenty two that you're in. I know it's bad. You know it's bad. The tech knows it's bad, but the test says it's okay. And how do you argue that? Oh, uh, you. I, it's not like I have some gun I can put to their head and make them. Um, Leaf Spa will tell me if there's, um, um, here's what I don't understand. How does rodent damage reduce the capacity of the battery? I mean, the rodents can get to the high voltage wires coming out of the pack, but the rodents can't get inside the pack because that's where the BMS is and that's where all the individual wires are. I mean, the, the rodent, if the rodents can get inside the pack, that's a, that's a Nissan issue. Why would they have their pack designed such that rodents can get into it? No, this is the, the battery has been clearly declining um, for over a year. Because I took it to them a year ago to have them run the battery test on it, because it seemed like the, the, the this car, the the even the battery capacity bars are degrading faster than my original 2012. My 2012, I lost my second battery bar at like 50,000 miles. This car lost its second battery bar at 35,000 miles, you know, 10,000 miles ago. And there's the problem, too. They say, oh, no, it's fine. Oh, no, it's fine. And then the warranty expires. Then suddenly, oh, it's not fine. <laughs> but how do you prove that they knew the problem existed a year ago? You know? Well, 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 well the problem, see, there's the problem, Manos. That's the, the car's worth twelve grand because of inflated car prices. Well, the problem is all the replacement cars are inflated in cost price as well. So, you know, it's not like my car went up in value and these cars are still worth less. No, they all went up in value. Well, see, that's just it. It isn't slow. Slow would be, you know, I would still have one battery bar. Because my original 24 kilowatt car, it took until like 50,000 miles before I lost the second battery bar. This car lost the second battery bar at 35,000 miles, so it's degrading almost twice as fast, even though it's a much newer, much more advanced battery. Well, see, there's, there's two things. You have the GOM, that's the G-O-M. We call it the guessometer, okay, because the car is guessing. Like, I get in the car right now, it's going to tell me I can go 78 miles. I cannot go 78 miles. I can go 47 miles, all right? And as you drive the car, that meter will slowly adjust and get closer to reality. Um, usually by the time you're almost out of power. So that's why you gotta be aware of your car's characteristics and how far you can actually go because the meter on the car is 
basically useless. I mean, it's not accurate at all. Especially for me, because when I go down the mountain, I'm using very little power, and I'm using lots of regeneration. So, it's the car makes an assumption that your current speed, distance, and power consumption are going to continue into the future. So, by the time I get down to the bottom of the mountain, it's telling me I can go 90 miles still. Because it's basing that estimation on the amount of power I consumed coasting down the mountain. And, of course, when I go back up the mountain, now I'm using a large amount of power because I'm climbing an 1,800-foot elevation. And so you'll very quickly see that meter go to a number that's more reasonable. Well, the problem is, even accounting for that, my meter is dropping twice as fast as it should because the voltage is telling it one thing, but the bad cells are creating a condition that generates a different result. So what happens is I'm losing 2% per mile when I drive. I should be losing about 1% per mile, but I'm losing more like 2 and a half, 2 and 3 quarter percent per mile because it's having to constantly recalculate my estimated range based on the new errant voltage reading it's getting from the pack because the cells are being pulled out of service because the cells are undervolting because there's bad cells. So that the 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 range meter on a car is completely worthless. Now as far as battery capacity bars, I don't know how the car determines that. Because you'll have an obvious reduction in range, but the battery capacity bars haven't adjusted yet. In fact, it appears to be timing, programming, and temperature based. So, for example, us in the LEAF community have gotten used to the fact that if you're going to lose a battery bar, it's going to happen in spring. For some reason, it never happens over winter. It happens when the car warms back up in the spring weather. Something happens in the programming, and the car goes, Oh, yeah, I have less capacity now. <laughs> so you always lose the battery bar in the spring. You never lose it in the summer. You never lose it in the wintertime. It's in the spring when you lose it. Now, obviously, there are people in hot environments where this is different, but for people like me who live in mild environments. But, um... Well, the car still works fine. It just only goes 47 miles. <laughs> the problem is, for how long? And the problem is, if I leave it there, they're not going to touch it. They're not going to touch the car. And there's nothing I can do to make them touch the car. That's not how it works. I know, but the problem is, if I, if I sell the car, then I'm still left with nothing. I have money I can't use. And if I end up using that money for other things, then I never get the car back. And that creates a double-edged sword because now I'm putting more miles and more wear and tear on the gas cars. And I'm going to have to start putting money into maintenance on those cars. <sighs> uh, well, I'm on a Nissan Leaf group. And, of course, i got to find my doggle so I can plug a Leaf Spy. Oh, Get more data. I also need to abuse the car a little bit. I need to take it up and down the mountain road a little bit. You know, really work it hard. You know, accelerate hard. Go 80 miles an hour. Because the harder you work it, the more that imbalance kicks in. And I, I need the car to generate hard codes. Right now, it's only generating soft codes because I drive gently. Yeah, but the battery capacity bars don't match that. The... Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, nobody can prove this, but I'm telling you, they program that to be conservative. They program that to not take off a battery bar until it absolutely has to. Because those battery capacity bars determine warranty. So the longer they can make it show higher bars, the higher the probability you'll be out of warranty before it drops to an amount that would be under warranty. I guarantee you they're gaming that programming to do that. There, there's no question in my mind they're gaming that programming. That, that, programming is, um, that programming is programmed to favor Nissan and not favor you. 
because if the car went down to eight battery bars it's an automatic battery replacement i just take it into the dealership and that that's that that indicator is an automatic battery replacement so they're going to program that to not show that until it absolutely has to well the thing is though <coughs> if i can get the battery replaced under warranty then of course i'll replace the battery you know it's a 2016 car it's only five years old <laughs> You know, so if I can get the if I can get the battery replaced under warranty, either the Nissan warranty or my car insurance warranty, my, my deductible is only a hundred bucks. Um, then I would rather have a brand new battery, especially since there's a good chance I'm going to get a forty kilowatt hour battery. They basically have stopped making. Um, Um, they basically stopped making the 30 kilowatt hour batteries, so people are starting to discover that when they get a battery replaced, they're getting a 40 kilowatt battery, which would be amazing. <laughs> that would be uh, almost, what, 140, 145 miles range? That'd be amazing. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I know. I do use them. And Because uh, remember, anytime I drive further than the electric car can go, I have to take the Kia. But... The local driving is what's going to beat the crap out of the car. You know, driving one mile to the grocery store and back. You know, driving three miles to the whatever and back. That's what's going to murder the gas car. You know, the long drive, going, you know, 50 miles and back, you know, that's not going to bother too much. The car's going to get all the way up to operating temperature. Everything's going to get lubed. You know, that's, that's good for it. It's the short drives that are bad for it that the electric car is optimal for. I did. That's what I did, Shadunk. And now they're telling me, sorry, we can't tell you anything. You've got to pay $725 for us to drop the battery pack, and then maybe we can tell you. <laughs> That's the problem. If they drop the battery pack and determine it's Nissan warrantyable, great, I get a new battery. If they drop the battery pack and determine it's rodent damage, great, my car insurance takes care of it. But if they drop the battery pack and it's not Nissan repairable and it's not rodent damage, but they can't put the battery back in for safety reasons, I'm fucked. Only if it's under warranty. If it's not under warranty, I have to pay that. And if they can't put the battery back in, I still have to pay the 725 and I'm stuck with a car and a battery pack that are separated from each other. <laughs> it's a big problem because I don't have the money. And I don't know what to do about it. I mean, I don't want to give up my electric car. I, I really like having my car. I like my car. But it's only got 45,000 miles on it. Yes, but they have a vested interest in making sure the third scenario comes up. You see what I mean? They're biased. You know, even if they're unintentionally biased, they're biased. No, it depends on why it's broken. That's the problem. It depends on why it's broken. And, they, and, and the fact that they won't tell me it has to either be defect or rodent damage. Because that would solve the problem. If it's defect or rodent damage, I'm covered. Defect, I'm covered by Nissan. Rodent damage, I'm covered by State Farm. The fact that they refuse to tell me if it could be anything else tells me it could be something else. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the user cannot break it. All they have to do is declare it's not covered by Nissan warranty. Even if it is covered by Nissan warranty, all they have to do is declare it's not. And now I have to hire a lawyer while the car is sitting there useless to fight them. Um, I doubt it. The car is worth 12000 so they probably wouldn't consider it total. Actually, it's worth more like seventeen. See, the problem is... um. When they pull the battery, that allows them to do more testing. I don't know why they can't do the testing now. I'm not sure why. For whatever reason, they have to pull the battery to further investigate the problem. 
if the wiring harness is damaged, they cannot put the battery back in. It can only be replaced. Now, I actually understand that because if the wiring harness is damaged, there's an electrocution risk to the technician that they now know about. Um, there has been no mishandling. I don't abuse that car. <laughs> that car's my baby. <laughs> um, the And plus, how do you mishandle a battery? Uh, what do you do to do that? Um, if they pull the battery out and determine this battery is not safe to reinstall, the problem is the battery might not be damaged enough to trigger Nissan warranty. Meaning I might have to drive it more to trigger the Nissan warranty because the car needs to start throwing hard codes. If it's throwing soft codes, that doesn't trigger warranty. You know, it, it sucks. That's the way they do it. To, they're doing it to protect themselves. But the car has to be throwing hard codes. There has to be a very... They have a decision tree in their manuals and their computers. And the car has to fit within one of those decision trees to go warranty replace if it makes it part way up one of those trees there's no warranty replacement um, so it has to that's why they say okay you got to drive the car hard you got to make it trigger some hard codes you know you got to force the software in the car to go okay yeah i got a hard problem here because you could have transient problems and the software is going to ignore those transient problems because they're transient so you got to push it hard enough to trigger hard codes to where the software finishes making it to the end of one of those decision trees that says, yep, this is the problem. And then the Nissan system goes, yep, that's the problem. And then the policy goes, yep, that's a warranty replace. Um, so I have to get the car to that point. Well, the problem is if they drop the battery and the battery is not safe for the technician to reinstall because of damage to something, that damage has to be rodent damage or I'm screwed. <laughs> well, no, they'll just keep your car. <laughs> and then they'll sue you. And then they'll win. <laughs> if that doesn't work, who's been farting? I, I mean, oh, you're from the UK. So your, your, your legal system over there is a little more sane than our legal system over here. Our legal system over here, you're innocent if you can afford to defend yourself. And you're right if you can afford to prove it. <laughs> Our legal system is a little different here. Um, uh, the fact that they won't tell me there is no option three or what the option three could be is the part that's scaring me. Because if they remove the battery and it cannot safely be reinstalled, and that process does not invoke either warranty from Nissan or replacement from my car insurance, I'm screwed. I'm stuck in a limbo spot of a car I can't take back home because it's now a car and a battery, not an electric car. I tried to drop that hint to the guy. I was like... If you could assure me there's rodent damage here. If you hand me a bill that says rodent damage, we're good. I hand that to my insurance company and they pay. You know, I can't outright tell him to fake something, but I, 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 I need to know it's going to be either Nissan warranty or rodent damage. Either one of those outputs is good. But if there's anything in between, I'm in deep shit. But there's the problem, though. If I move forward and it does not go to option A or option B, then I'm out $15,000 no matter what. On top of that, I'm now indebted to Nissan. And I would probably have to pay someone to tow the car home because AAA is not going to tow it since it's not, you know, a roadside issue. It's a, it's a, it's at a dealership. So they're not going to tow it. So I'm going to have to pay someone to tow the car home. And then I'm going to have to bring my trailer down and haul the battery back to the house. Because the battery is going to be separated from the car. <sighs> because I don't have the $8,000 to put into replacing the battery. And I don't think the car is worth $8,000 to replace the battery. Because if something else goes wrong, 
and I can't afford to fix it, like for example, if the OBC fails, that's $1,800 I would have to pay in order to keep my $15,000 color with $8,000 replacement battery going that I'm still paying for. <laughs> I'm overthinking it because they won't simplify it. They're trying to play, they're trying to keep all their cards undercover because they want to protect themselves. They don't want to eat the cost of this warranty replacement. So they are going to maintain as many options as they can, even though that screws me. Um, I was actually thinking about that. I was thinking if I sold the minivan and sold the bus and sold the car, that would get me, I'd get 12 or 11, 8 for the car. It's going to give me 10 because I got to pay off the loan. I could, I'm, I don't know if I can get four for the minivan. I'm hoping I can get four for the minivan and I might be able to get four or five for the bus. That gets me somewhere close to 20 grand. I can buy a car for 20 grand. Oh. But the problem is, once I sell the bus, I'm never getting another one. Never. So my my project of turning it into a mobile maker space, that dies completely. Because... The only way I can get another bus for that price would be to go back to Pennsylvania. Because around here, buses 10 years older than that one sell for four or $5,000. So once I sell the bus, that is a non-reversible decision. I can never undo it, and I could never get another bus because I'm never going to have that kind of money to be able to buy another bus again. So that's why I've been leaning away from doing that because... Well, I don't have anything in it. the The only thing in the bus is the four, um, the four pallet crates with all my filament in it, because um I haven't had the means to get it out of there yet. Otherwise, the bus is empty. I've made it a point to not use the bus for storage, to avoid exactly that problem. Uh, realistically, within two or three years, yeah, I should be able to. I, obviously, I could never have predicted a pandemic would start and decimate my income. Uh, there was no way for me to predict that. <laughs> so, um, you know, once we're no longer in a pandemic, inflationary, supply chain problem environment, my income should return to normal. Well, I only drive it local. You know, the the whole the reason for driving the bus local only is not because of fuel economy. It's because of breaking down. You, the last thing you want to do is put twenty thousand dollars in material on a bus, drive it two thousand miles away, and you break down and you can't afford to get the bus home. You you want to avoid that. So until I have the finances to know I could repair the bus remotely, if I had to, I would only take it locally, you know, within two hundred miles, so that you know my AAA would allow me to get the bus back home. Uh, I have AAA Premier Plus RV, so they will tow the bus home. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good for storage, and I've made it a point not to use the bus for storage. The only thing still on the bus is stuff that has been on the bus from when I got here. I have not put anything new on the bus because I don't want to fill it up. If I fill the bus up, I'm never going to empty it. <laughs> so I, I don't want to do that. Um, but the problem is I would still need to sit on that money for about a year. Okay. I would need to sit on that money until a year, year and a half from now. So I would still be without an electric car for a year, year and a half, which means I would be incurring increased wear and tear on the gasoline car in that year and a half. Because you have new tax credits coming out for electric cars that are going to be refundable, meaning people like me can actually get the EV tax credit. And... All the more affordable, longer-range EVs are coming out. Uh, no, I don't really need the bus. It was going to be a project for the channel. I was going to turn it into a mobile makerspace. So the problem with the bus is that the potential income and benefit I can gain from keeping it exceeds what it's worth. And... While the bus is worth a pretty decent amount, it's not worth an extraordinary amount. It's not worth a life-altering amount. Um, 
Uh, the film, it's been fine. Remember, I live in the desert. I don't have any inland on PLA. Um, inland. Where'd you get inland? Is that from... It was inland from Joanne's or Michael's? Is that where inland is from? Or is that from um, Micro Center? Who was selling inland PLA? I don't have any inland PLA, but I, 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 remember, I remember that name, inland PLA. Um, I am fascinated by the idea of trying to make a mobile maker space out of the bus. I think that would be fun. And I think I could do it mostly for free. I think companies would donate equipment to put in the bus. I might even be able to get, um, you know, someone like Home Depot or Lowe's on board for such a project for the lumber, you know, to build the, um, um, the benches inside. Um, that's probably the smartest move. That's that. Well, not smartest. Smartest would be to fight the Nissan dealership, but that's probably the economically safest move. Um, the big unknown is I don't know what the minivan's worth, and in fact, yeah, that's a person who has the tools, the means, and the capacity to do that, which I lack. I mean. Uh, there's a company in Oregon that for $13,000, they'll put a 60 kilowatt battery in my leaf. I'll have a 200 mile um, range leaf, a 230 mile range leaf. The problem is, it'll be a 230 mile range leaf without a warranty. <laughs> so now I'll have $26,000 into a car that I might not be able to afford to fix if it breaks down. That's why I only buy them under warranty. Because I can't afford to repair these cars, so I need the warranty to be able to repair them. What I did not realize is that the warranty, the dealers, once again, that dealership screwed me again. I didn't realize that the warranty, the seven year, 94,000 mile warranty that that dealer put on the car was a third party warranty. It was not a Nissan warranty. I didn't know that. I should have. I don't know. I don't know how I should have. I mean, I bought it from a fucking Nissan dealership. Yeah. Uh, but somehow, I guess I should have known. But, um... Take it to local universities, events, fairs, and stuff like that. Introduce people to all the maker technology that we have today. So I'd have a, I'd have a resin station, uh, a couple of FDM stations, multicolor station... I'd have a soldering station, a, a computer Arduino station, a power tools woodworking station, you know, a, a, a composite station. You know, I'd, I'd have different stations the length of the bus. I got 40 feet. So if I put three feet to each station, I got 30 feet. That's 10 stations I could put on the bus for different types of, you know, modern maker technology. You know, have a laser cutter in there, have a, a 3D printer in there, have this resin printer in there, have, you know, a soldering and electronic station in there, uh, woodworking power tool station, you know, just, you know, exposing, you know, the local community and, you know, like go to the, the state fair every year. I could, it would only be 25 miles. I'd have to drive the bus to the state fair. And, um, you know, to local schools, you know, if they want to have an open fair, have, have the kids come out and walk through the bus, and I can explain each station and the kind of technologies available. I just think that would be fun. It, it would, it would, I think it would help the channel. I think it would be paying it forward. I think it would be a lot of fun. I think it would be a very interesting project. But that project is possible because I have the bus. Well, I'd make money here. <laughs> You know, first of all, all the equipment would be free, so I, that would be free money. I would have all, I would have access to very nice equipment. You know, each station would be dedicated to a manufacturer, so they're they're going to want to donate their best equipment. And um, so then, you know, that's you know, there's probably going to be twenty thousand dollars worth of a maker equipment inside the bus. <laughs> you know, so I, I just made twenty grand, <laughs> and then you know the 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 YouTube revenue and the. Um, support on the channel for that project because that would be dozens and dozens of videos you know this is how I make money I make money making videos and um, so I think that would be a very cool project it's not gonna it's not gonna make me money like you made money but it's going to increase my overall revenue over time I will make more money 
And, um, I mean, how much? I don't know. I, I have no idea. And, and hell, when I'm done with it and, the, and the, it's worn off and it's not cool anymore, I can sell it all. But, um, um, but that is predicated on me having the bus. If I don't have the bus, I can't do that. And if I get rid of the bus, I can never get another bus. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going to have that kind of money. Um, you know, a, a bus of that condition around here is going to cost a lot more than I can afford. Um, exactly. It would help. Well, well, how do you grow a channel? You grow a channel by adding more content. <laughs> that would be more content. Um, but um, the pandemic showed up, killed everything. You know, I was figuring on, you know, putting aside 25% of my income for about a year, year and a half. And then I would have enough money, you know, I would have a little nest egg. You know, I was making, um, you know, twelve, fourteen hundred a month with this channel. That's not a lot of money, but for me, that's a lot of money. So I was figuring I'd be able to put aside four hundred bucks a month. Four hundred dollars a month times eighteen months. That's seventy-two hundred dollars. Okay, that creates my escrow that I want. In order to be able to travel with the bus, I want a $5,000 expenditure account. Well, if I subtract $5,000 from that, that's $2,200. So I could put $5,000 in a dedicated savings account called the bus fund, and I would have $2,200 to put into materials in the bus for whatever it is that I couldn't get donated. Um, yeah, I think you might be right, and if that looks like it's going to be the case, then I would get rid of it. But remember, I live in the desert. Things don't rot here. I mean, we have cars from the 80s driving around. They're not showroom cars that have been restored. They're simply cars from the 80s that are still driving around because nothing rusts here. Oh, yeah, his, his quality of production is phenomenal. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but the work he puts into that... But then again, yeah, like I said... You want to make that kind of money? You got to put in that kind of work. So he earns his money. Um, you're talking about San Latterer, right? And, um, well, my problem is I was borderline. I was just making enough to be comfortable. The pandemic hit. I went from making twelve to 1400 a month to making 600 a month. Now I can't put anything aside. So the idea was I could, well, that's just it. Used car prices have not affected the bus prices. Um, because a bus is not a regular vehicle that gets driven around every day. So the bus value has not been inflated like the car value has been inflated. The bus was worth about four or five grand a year ago. It's worth about four or five grand now. It's it, it, Its value has not gone up. So... I don't gain anything directly selling it now. I don't. I don't. There's no pandemic gain like there is selling the car. You know, after this supply chain stuff goes away, that car is going to be worth seven thousand dollars. Now, if I have a new battery in it, I don't care because uh, you know I want to drive the car. You know, I want to use the car. You know, I need the car <laughs> because the you know. You know, uh, short of the battery going bad like it is, that's a fluke. That's a one in a million. Short of that, the car is maintenance free. I have not put a single dime into that car except for tires and wiper blades. I haven't put, in, in 45,000 miles, I haven't put a single penny into that car. There's no oil changes. There's no brake pads to change because they're going to last forever. I mean, the, the car is literally maintenance free. It's just tires and wiper blades. And, um... So the plan was put aside money for a year and a half. $2,200 would cover anything that I don't get donated from companies. And it would allow me to make a basic mobile maker space bus. And then um, the $5,000 would sit in an escrow account in case the bus ever broke down. So if I broke down, I could just tell the medic, okay, okay, whatever it needs, do it. And then I pull from the escrow fund. And then I keep the bus local until I build up that escrow fund again. That's just it. I don't know. Well, you have to plan a year or two. If you don't plan a year or two down the road, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. 
the whole point of the whole reason this card decision is difficult is because I have to figure out what each decision I make is going to do to me over the next two or three years. So, for example, I sell the car. Let's say let's say I sell the car and I get the eleven thousand eight hundred for it. Okay, this is pretty easy to do actually. So let's say here's a notepad window. Okay, so sell car. $11,800. I'm going to lose $2,600 paying off the car. So let's call let's just call it 10 grand cuz I have some money in the bank. So I'm net positive $10,000. Let's say okay, worst case scenario, the air conditioning on the minivan doesn't work. That's going to hurt its value quite a lot because I live in the desert. Everything else works, but the air conditioning doesn't work. And it's also pretty old. It's a 2004 with 140,000 miles. So inflated prices or not, it's not going to be worth that much. Um, if I sell the mini, let's let's say worst case scenario, I get twenty five hundred dollars, right? And I sell the bus. Let's call it wonderful. Um, let's call it amazing. Let's say I get five grand for it. All right, so that's um seventeen fifty. Uh, I'll have seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Um, now that's actually not that bad if if they actually make the EV tax credits refundable meaning I actually get that off the price of the car as cash um, you're looking at 35,000 for a new car like the new Kia Soul EV uh, you can't sell the containers not worth anything to sell because there's no way to move them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody who's willing to buy one has to be willing to move it, um, and that costs money. You know, it's a, you're talking twelve hundred bucks to pay a shipper to come move the car, and that was back before the pandemic. Um, so I, I gained far more value for the containers than selling them. I wouldn't make enough to um, be worth selling. So thirty-five thousand dollars for a new car. Let's say I get eight thousand dollars in tax credit. Five, six, seven, eight. That brings it down to um, what twenty-seven thousand? Yeah, twenty-seven thousand um, minus the seventeen five that I saved would bring us down to ninety-five hundred dollars. I might be able to afford that payment, maybe. You know, in that in that year and a half from now, I'll probably be doing better. I could probably afford the payment on a ninety-five hundred dollar loan, and then I'll have a brand new car with a full warranty and over two hundred miles of range. That would be the ideal scenario. But the only way to get to that is to sell those three things, actually get that much money for those three things, and put that money aside without touching it. So I would have to save that money and not touch it for two years. Because ideally, I would get a year-old Kia Soul for like $22,000. And then I'd only have to take out like a $4,000 loan to pay the difference. Here's the problem. This is why you have to think two or three years in the future. <laughs> They're really worth that much, huh? I'll, I'll look into it. It would have to be worth an awful lot for me to get rid of one. Because I'd have to figure out what to do with the stuff in it. <laughs> All three of them are pretty full. Not full to the top, but full in area, you know. Because you, you need an aisle down the middle to walk into the thing, so you things are lined up on the sides. Um, I could probably condense down to two. The third one is, now that I got rid of the wood pellets, the wood pellets were taking up 25% of one of the containers. So now that I got rid of the wood pellets, I could probably condense three down to two. Um, but it would have to be worth a stupid amount of money. Like, if I'm only going to get 1500 bucks, $2,000, it's not worth it. I'd rather keep it. Um, now, if somebody said, no, we'll give you $6,000, okay. I can pay off some stuff with $6,000. But if I'm only going to get, you know, 1500 two grand, not worth it. 
Um, I can't even build a shed for that price. <laughs> what would I do with the money? Um, here's the problem. I have to think two or three years down the road. Okay. Well, the problem is I'm not going to be able to sit on $17,500, assuming I get that much. I'm not going to be able to sit on that money for that amount of time. Because if I incur an expense, I'm going to have to take the money from that to pay for it. Because putting it on a credit card and incurring interest when I have cash sitting there would be stupid. Okay? So, that means... Well, first of all, that means I'm probably better off not getting rid of the minivan. I'm probably better off keeping the minivan. The minivan is the least valuable vehicle I own. And the only time it would be uncomfortable to drive that minivan would be in the heat of summer. And I could probably fix the air conditioner. I do have a vacuum pump and a manifold kit. I can probably fix the AC. Um, eventually, you know, save up the money. Have a mechanic help me. I have the equipment. Just need the mechanical skill. The smart move then would be to... Um, Michelle can't work. She's 364 pounds. She's mentally handicapped. She's never going to work. Yeah, but that's $6,500 if they move it. Meaning they're going to move it and they're going to give me $6,500? I find that hard to believe. Because I'd sell one for $6,500. Yeah, well, that it's, it's, it's going to be my channel and she's going to be helping me. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing that more so that I can get her doing something. I can get her stimulated. I can get her actually doing something instead of just sitting in her room all day. Yeah, exactly. You can't just find somebody to relocate it. You have to pay a company who knows how to relocate those things. Uh, you're you're talking two thousand twenty five hundred bucks to move the thing. So now that container is going to cost you, you know, nine thousand dollars. You think I can get sixty five hundred dollars and they'll move it? I would do that. I would probably I would do the work to sell one if I can get sixty five hundred bucks, because that would pay off the electric car. And that would pay off the um, the Kia. That would pay both of them off to zero. Which means I'd be able to keep the full 11.8 I get from selling the Leaf. And I would have no monthly payment for the Kia anymore. Let's see. 36. I owe 6,200. It'd be close. It'd be close. I'm going to look into that. That If they're actually getting that much and they move it, if they're getting that much, including them moving it, that might be worth selling one. Huh. That's interesting. Thank you, Shadong. I'm going to look into that today. Um, so, the smart move would be to keep the minivan. Why keep the minivan? It gets 30 miles per gallon, and I can just drive it until it dies. And that would stop me from abusing the Kia. Um, so the Kia would last a lot longer. And I'd be able to maintain the limited usage regime that I want to use on the Kia to avoid wearing it out too quickly. Because um, because that's a, that's a 2017 Kia. It's only got 70,000 miles on it. I mean, I, I would like to get another 70,000 miles on that car before I have to do any major maintenance. Um, if I use a limited usage routine and I get a little bit lucky, I can get that. I could probably get, you know, six or seven years out of that car before I have to do any major maintenance on it. That's one of the reasons I've been reluctant to go back to pizza delivery, even part-time. If I went back to pizza delivery, my concern is that I would incur higher maintenance on the car that would exceed the income I make from delivering the pizza. Delivering pizza makes sense when it's electric because your biggest expense, fuel and maintenance, are basically zero. But as soon as you have to spend gas and maintenance, pizza delivery is not very profitable. <laughs> um, but I could use the minivan. 
you know, I could just drive the minivan until it dies. You know, until the repairs exceed what I can afford. Um, oh, man. That's so fucking annoying. This pandemic sucks. <laughs> you know, the damage from it sucks. How do I buy another cheap vehicle in this market? I mean, around here, a piece of shit sells for three or four thousand dollars. You know, it's it's just it's the nature of um, both where I live and the current crazy used car market. Oh wow, that's a nice metal shelf for one hundred twenty bucks. Jesus Christ. It's a loudspeaker. Yeah, Michelle. What's that? Oh, good. Hopefully it's the 90 days. All right, we'll go take care of it. When we're done here. Yeah. All right, bye. Okay. Bye. Uh... No, I figure the pandemic situation is going to last two more years before we, and two more years is not finished. Two more years is we're on the way to recovery. I figure at least two more years. I figure mid 2023, we're going to start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. If, if you're higher income, maybe you'll see that light at the end of the year, but the lower incomes, probably a little longer. <coughs> um, so, for example, let me find uh, just an example here. Uh, scooter won't work. Most of them won't let you do that. Um... Uh, okay, here's a little political humor for you. Uh, I'm starting a thing I call, you know, Chris's conspiracy theory. Okay, so so here's my idea of a humorous conspiracy theory. You're gonna, you're gonna love this. It's it's so crazy, it might actually be plausible. Okay, so here's my conspiracy theory. Trump stole the election. Trump rigged the election and stole the election but he purposely rigged it to make biden win like he rigged the election so that he would lose and biden would win and all the crazy shit he's been doing is to hide this fact that he rigged the election for biden to win because in his four years he trashed the economy so badly that he knows that these next few years are going to be an absolute shit show. And he wanted to blame it on the Democrats so that the Republicans could come back as the white knights in shining armor on their horses, saving the day, and destroy the Democrats once and for all. That's my conspiracy theory. <laughs> it's just crazy enough to be plausible. He's just sociopathic enough that that might be plausible. <laughs> See you later, Ronald. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, we'll remember that 25 cents. I'll, you're saying 2023. I'm saying mid to end of 2023. So, we'll see who's right in a year and a half. <laughs> um, let's see. Where are some cars? Come on. Where are some cars? Ooh, nice wood shelving. I'm always looking for shelving because the more shelving I can get and put in the containers, the more stuff I can organize. 2030. Oh, yeah. Full recovery probably would be 2030. These are usually uh, five to ten year things. But we're talking about most of the stuff is looking better. 
He's saying 2023. I'm saying mid to end of 2023. Um, forget about pickup trucks. They're ridiculously valuable. In fact, uh, I, the smart move would be to sell my pickup truck, but it's just too valuable to me. You know, I use it very, very little, but when I do use it, I need it. It's 11 p.m. there? Holy crap, dude. You have a great night. Um, let's see, where's cars at? Come on, oh, vehicles. Let's just go to vehicles. So look here. Here's a, um, you don't want a Volkswagen. Trust me, you don't want a Volkswagen. They're expensive. But here's a 2012 Volkswagen for $9,000. This car is 10 years old, and it's selling for nine grand. It should be four. It should be a $4,000 car. Um, actually, that's not a bad deal if it runs. Does not run, needs transmission work. Okay, that's why that car is so cheap. So the only cars that are experiencing um, the current car psycho value increase are cars that run. So if the car doesn't run, you get no boost. Um, this a 2015 Kia Sedona minivan. It's a seven-year-old minivan. It's $15,000. <laughs> See you later, Colin. You have a great Christmas and New Year. Um, here's a 2003 Ford Ranger, 20-year-old Ford Ranger, $3,500. That's actually cheap <laughs> in the current prices. A 2006 Forester, $5,000. A 2008 Jeep Commander, $5,500. That's actually pretty cheap um, in these current in this current environment. Um, here's a 2006, so that one's broken. It's $1,500, it's broken. Ooh, I like that trailer. It looks lightweight. I'm going to have to look at that. Um, but the prices are just crazy. A 2008 Dodge Nitro, that's actually not that bad a price. Um, it's not the most horrible. It's still inflated, but it's not a horrible price. Does it work? Needs rotors and brake pads. Gas gauge is broke. AC doesn't work. So it has no AC in a desert environment that hits 100 degrees. And the gas gauge is broken and it needs brakes and rotors. So that actually explains why that car is selling so cheap. Um, that might actually be worth looking into for a pizza delivery car. It's, it's higher up. So it's going to be easy for me to get in and out of. It's going to have lots of space. It's going to be able to handle all the dirt roads and all the funky roads that we have here that are basically off-road trails. Um, the gas gauge being broken is no big deal. Fill the car every day. Just fill the tank every day, and it doesn't matter if the gas gauge is broken. Now, here's a big thing. I, I didn't know this. Um, I grew up learning how to fix my own cars, you know, you know, the, the very first thing I did on a car was an oil change, and the very second thing I did on a car when I was like 10 years old was change the brakes on a car. You know, our family has always done our own work on our cars, and, um, you know, we would have a mechanic friend who would help us with the stuff that was beyond what we were capable of doing. What's that? Um, so, um, for me, I... I People will actually replace a car if it needs tires, brakes, and rotors. And the first time I heard that, my first thought was, are you mentally fucking retarded? What's, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you replace a car for 200 bucks of stuff? And then I found out most people don't buy used tires. Most people go to Firestone. They would pay $700 to put tires on that car. Most people don't change their own brakes. Most people take the car to the dealership and pay whatever they charge to change the brakes. I was sitting 
in O'Neill Nissan dealership. You know, it was a it was a, a recall service on the car. Regular service is free. It's part of the warranty. You know, they just had to check the battery, and there was some kind of plate they wanted to replace on the battery, or whatever. It's like whatever. Fine, it's recall. It's free. So I'm there. They're doing that. They're doing that warranty work on the car, and I'm sitting in the waiting room, and. This happens three or four times in the four hours I was sitting there. Okay, they told me it was four hours, but I said, "No, fine, fine, fine. I'll wait." You know, I don't want to bother somebody to come pick me up because it's a forty-minute ride. Um, this is back in Pennsylvania. Um, so I I see this happen four times, maybe five. It's four or five times. You know, the the tech comes in, sits down to you, and says, "Oh, Mister So and So, here's what we got. You know, your car needs brakes." Your car needs rotors, and you know this is what it costs, and this is what we do, and warranty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, seven hundred and fifty dollars to do pad and rotor replacement on the rear, five hundred sixty-nine dollars to do front brakes and rotors, six hundred and three dollars brakes and rotors, four hundred and eighty-nine dollars brakes and rotors. And do you know what every one of these people said? Every single one of them. How long will it take? Oh, we could do it in an hour. Okay, signed. <laughs> oh, except for my electric car, I never paid that much for a car. <laughs> and these people are dropping thousands of dollars to do brakes. Like it's nothing. I'm thinking 30 bucks for brake pads at AutoZone and an hour and a half of my time. And these people are dropping 750 bucks on rear brakes and $600 on front brakes. So I started doing some math. 700 plus 700 plus 700. That's $2,100. If you were to just go to Firestone and say, give me four new tires, and if you were to go to the dealership and say, do front brakes and rotors, everything, you're going to spend $2,100. Now I understand why people would buy a new car instead of repairing their car. Now it makes sense. Why would you put $2,100 into your $5,000 car when you could just spend six grand and get another car that has all good brakes and tires? Now it starts to make sense. Now it's like, oh my God, that's why these people, that's why I'm able to buy these cars for $2,200 that need tires and brakes and shit. Because, uh, you know, I would, I, the guy would say, well, it needs tires and brakes. I'm like, okay, that's no big deal. I don't care. And he's like, really? I was like, yeah, they're, they're consumables. That's not a big deal. I'll just replace them. <laughs> I go to my tire guy, 20 bucks a tire, 80 bucks. I got four new tires on the car. I go to AutoZone, drop 180 bucks, and I got all new brake pads and rotors around the whole car. Three hours later, the car's got new tires, new brakes, and new rotors. That's just normal to me. <laughs> to me, it was 300 bucks, not even. Including gas driving around is less than three hundred bucks, but to average Joe, it's two or three thousand dollars, and I'm just like, how do people have enough money to pay for this? I mean, these people are paying more to repair a car than I would pay for the whole car. <laughs> you know what I started doing? I started looking for cars that needed brakes and tires. <laughs> I was like, oh man, this car needs brakes and tires. Will you take 1400 bucks? Yeah, sure. You got cash today? Yep, I'll be right over. <laughs> I, I, I never understood it. I, I never went to a dealership to get brakes done. I never went to a regular tire shop to get tires done. I mean, um, I mean, just, we've never had that kind of money. So we would never do that. Um, it was the first time I learned that when I realized this is what people actually pay for this stuff, it blew my mind. Like I sat there looking at the guy in the Nissan dealership and this lady over here was looking at me, looking at them, watching my jaw hit the floor. And I'm like, and the dealership guy walks away. 
and I look at the guy, and I was like, did he really say $1,400? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I, of course, keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to insult the guy, but it was you had to see it on my face. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Oh my God! It, just, it blew my mind. I I I, I guess it is a, it, it's one of those. Have you been living in a cave all your life? Yes, yes, I have. And I just left the cave, and I'm blown the fuck away. Because <laughs> in my cave, we don't do that. <laughs> if a guy came up to me and said seven hundred and sixty nine dollars to do brakes and rotors, I'd laugh at him. <laughs> but it's not a lot of work. It's a $10 toolkit from Walmart and the jack that's already in your car. I mean, especially front brakes, you know, rotors and pads. Shoes are a pain in the ass. I hate doing shoes. Man, I don't change shoes until it's metal on metal. <laughs> until I think it's metal on metal, until I think it's getting that close. I hate doing shoes. They're not, it's not, it's, it's a pain in the ass. Shoes are a pain in the ass. But, um, but, but, you know, even if I had to replace the caliper, matter of fact, half the time, I didn't even care if the caliper was good or bad. I just replaced the caliper. It was 35 bucks. 35 bucks for the caliper, $26 for the rotor, $12 for the set of brake pads. I didn't care. I just bought all three and replaced all three. You know, I'd have my brother pump the pedal and I'd bleed the system and I'd go and do the other side. In two hours, we're done. <laughs> I don't know. Is two hours of my time worth two thousand one hundred dollars yes <laughs> I mean, oh just uh, it, um, they're, they're not bad people or anything it was just it was a um what do you call it i um it was an eye-opening experience it was it was a a shock to my system it's like showing a caveman you know your cell phone it was just like that happens <laughs> Oh my God! Oh, it's worth it now because I don't have any. Ch they want fifty bucks to do an oil change. I was like, "Yeah, I'll do it myself for thirteen dollars." Thank you. <laughs> Back in PA, I would never do an oil change. The local shop would do it for twenty-one dollars. It cost me fourteen to do it myself. Why? For an extra six dollars, just let them do it, and they grease everything up while they're under there. But out here, that doesn't exist. So out here it's cheaper for I have enough oil to do the next four or five oil changes on my vehicles. So um you know I I got some on Vine, I got some cheap, I brought some with me, you know, all my oil stuff came with me when I moved here. I had like four gallons of oil that came with me. <laughs> um but this might actually be a decent delivery vehicle. You know, it's 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 old, but it's not crazy old. You know, it's 14 years old, 3100 bucks. You know, I could put 200 bucks into it, take care of the rotors, the pads, and the AC. And who cares about the gas gauge? You know, just let, just fill it up every day. Drive it. You're never going to drain the whole tank in one day, so. No, I, I bought a Kia Soul, um, but, but he was saying buy a used car to do the pizza delivery. And what I'm saying is that, you know, short of something like this, that's actually pretty hard to do because they're pretty expensive. You know, like here, like... Well, 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 I'm not touching that. Ford Escapes are bad news. <laughs> Ford Escapes are nightmares. Stay away from Ford Escapes. <laughs> but, um... Wow, 3300 bucks for a Jeep? I don't have the money, but... Was running great before the fire. Yep, walk away from that. Uh, unless, you're, unless you're a grease monkey, you walk away from that. <laughs> uh, that's gotta be fake. Oh, he's selling parts off of it. Okay. You know, here's a 2007 Murano, eight grand. You know, the the prices are really inflated. These vehicles should not cost this much. So saying buy a cheap used vehicle, well, that doesn't exist. You you, you can't, especially around here. Yeah, you know, because I live in an island, you can't really get a cheap used vehicle very easily. Um, <clears throat> So far, the only viable one I've seen is that Nitro. Look at this, 2015 Dodge Journey, 14 grand. That's insane. That's way too much for that car.
ninety thousand dollars. Oh, what? What Jeep Wrangler could be worth ninety nine thousand dollars? Oh, it's a Wagoneer, first of all. That ain't worth $90,000. Oh my God, it is. Holy shit! The base price is $73,800! <laughs> wow! I want this trailer. That's a nice freaking trailer. I don't like the, I don't like the wooden bottom. Yeah. I don't like the neck. That used to be an ATV trailer. That was a side-by-side -side ATV or Sea-Doo trailer, you know, for jet skis. And they put that frame around it. You see, the I like the walls because they're aluminum. That's nice and lightweight. But that wooden deck is really freaking heavy. Like, really, really, really freaking heavy. Yeah. Uh, if that was an aluminum bottom, I'd be all over this shit. I like this. 80 bucks for a decent-sized shelf. 92 and a half inches long. Uh, it's a little bit wide at 27 inches, but it would still fit. But shelving is, is if you can find cheap shelving, it's out here, you, that's something you always need. You just always need shelving. Because shelving lets you go vertical. And this, I want. I want this. I'm going to go get this today if it's available. I mean, this one, this, this piece here alone is like 165, 190 bucks depending on which one it is. And then this here is another 150 And he wants 120 for both. Oh, fuck yeah. I'm all over that shit if I can get it. And that, actually, that's six shelves. That's unusual. Most of them are not six shelves. And it's on wheels. That, that's 350 400 bucks. That's a lot of money right there. Oh, God, that's a lot of money right there. <clears throat> oh, I couldn't even take the electric car to go get that if I wanted to. But I would just take the pickup truck and just fuck it. Just take the pickup truck and get it all in one shot. Ooh, that's nice shelving. <laughs> Usually that's hyperinflated here. $90,000. I could buy my house twice. I could buy both the houses I was looking at and still have enough money left over to buy a brand new car. I could buy both this house and the house over on Orange Street that I was looking at. That went for $28,000. I could buy both of these houses and still have enough money left over to buy a brand new car for the price of this thing. <laughs> oh my god! Wow! It's a mobile home. Mobile homes don't go up in value. It probably is worth more. Oh, well, obviously it's worth more now because everything's working now. I have an HVAC system. I have working water. I have working power. All that's going to make it worth a whole lot more. But, yeah. Jesus. That's ridiculous. To imagine only the top 8% in the country make enough to buy a car like that. The top eight, you have to be in the top eight to ten percent to afford a car like that. <laughs> Jesus. That's incredible. That's just, that's mind blowing. <laughs> uh, eight year old Jeep, $17,000. Yeah, no thank you. Here's a 99 Cavalier. That's a good pizza delivery car. Pulls at 100, so you're accelerating this thing at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, well, I don't know if I want a car you beat up that bad. But 1350 for a 99 Cavalier, that's a good piece of delivery car, but not good for me. 
because I'm six foot four inches tall, 450 pounds, I won't fit in that car. <laughs> You'd see me crawling out of that car like somebody coming out of a monkey bars. I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to literally climb in and out of that car. Now that's actually a pretty reasonable price for that car. Why is that so cheap? Two hundred and thirty thousand miles. That's why. Still, four grand for that's not bad. You know, it's only twelve years old, and it's a relatively nice car, but that is high miles for a Nissan. That's high miles. It's clean though. I mean, they they really. I mean, it has to be all highway miles. They really took care of it. I'll save that. That's nice. Uh, let's see. Anything else? As you can see, the prices are, are pretty spicy. Ford Focus, stay away from it. They constantly need repair. I uh, just avoid Ford Focus like the Plague. Focus, Edge, and the other one that I saw, the, um, the other Ford one, to just avoid them. They're no good. <laughs> Mazda 6 Mazda makes good cars Mazda, Hyundai um, Mitsubishi they make good cars their cheap cars just last see that's a little high $8,000 for a 10 year old Honda Civic yeah that's a little high that should be more like four and a half, five, with 130,000 miles Toyota RAV4, oh, that's a 19, that's why it's 32,000. Stop it. So, yeah, you can see prices out here are pretty inflated. And there's also not that much available. I'm surprised how little is available. Well, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, 2016. Do they even have any? So there's a 2017 Leaf SV, 17991. Uh, here's a 2000. See, here's a 2000. That's a Versa Note. That's actually not that bad. A Versa, the Versa Note's not bad. It only got 77,000 miles. That's actually not a bad deal. That Juke is too expensive. That Juke should not be $8,000. <laughs> like here's a 2012 SL, five grand. But the battery's bad. It has half capacity. Um, and is that it for Leafs? Here's a newer Leaf. No, that's a Versa. That's a Versa, not a Leaf. That's not a Ford Explorer. That's a Jeep Cherokee XJ. So, somebody's losing their brains. <laughs> Here's a 2013 Leaf SV going for $9,000. Yeah, I would not buy that for $9,000. It's the, uh, mine's a 2016. This is a, um, this is going to be the first gen. Oh, well, 13 will, might have a second gen, first gen battery. A second revision of the first gen battery. Maybe. Probably not. Most of the Lizard packs didn't come out until 2015. So it's a first gen car with a 24 kilowatt battery. It could only go about 80 miles when it was brand spanking new. And this one has... Doesn't even tell you how many miles. Oh, I can't see the battery gauge. Uh, they're making it a point not to show you the battery gauge? Yeah. They're making it a point not to show you the dash. You know, it's, it's not down to halfway because I can still see battery bars there. But, yeah, I would not trust the um, the range that car can go. Uh, my highest mileage was my 1988 Jeep Cherokee. Uh, let me see if I can find a picture of it for you.
I don't know if I have a picture online anywhere. I might not anymore. Um, I had a 19, my first car was a 1988 Jeep Cherokee. I actually sold it 2015. I think 2015 I sold it. Summer of 2015, I sold it for 900 bucks. I sold it to a guy on a farm for $900, and it had 497,000 miles on it. <laughs> I bought it with 90,000 miles, so I put um, 380,000 miles on that car myself on top of the 90,000 miles the previous owner put on it. So, um... Yeah, I put a lot of miles in that car. <laughs> but that was back when gas was 90 cents a gallon. <laughs> so, and I, and I and actually with the uh, with the with the 4 inch lift and 31 inch tires cuz I did some off-roading with it. Um, I actually got um, 24 25 miles per gallon on the highway with that car. Yeah, I was very good at squeezing fuel economy out of it. Um but yeah, I would not pay nine thousand dollars for a two thousand thirteen Leaf. I don't care how good the battery is. I, I would not pay nine thousand dollars for a Leaf that old. But um, eh, what are you gonna do? The best thing, oddly enough, for deliveries a minivan, you got the fuel economy, you got the comfort, and you got the space. Uh, two thousand nine Dodge Grand Caravan, forty eight hundred dollars. That's actually fair. That's actually a reasonable price. Um, yeah, and only 110,000 miles? That's actually not a bad deal for that minivan. And it looks fine. With only 110,000 miles, that's actually not bad. That's actually a pretty good deal. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is what I have. This is actually the vehicle I have, except mine's a darker gray. I have a um, 2004 Nissan Quest SE. And I repaired everything. So everything has been repaired. The um, navigation works. The Bose sound system works. The um, the GPS works. The, the six-disc CD changer works. I had to replace it all because it was all bad. But I replaced all of it. Everything in the car works except for the air conditioning. So I have the the dark silver one. This is the gold one, champagne colored one. But this is the exact car. I, have. I don't have running boards. That's actually in nice condition. But here's what I love about this car. Yeah, here's, they, they got to have pictures of it. How could they not have pictures of it? They, they did not include pictures of the, the primary feature of this car. I cannot believe they don't have pictures of that. It's like the biggest feature of the whole car. Hang on, I'll find a picture of it. So there's one. And here's the other one. It's 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 literally the biggest feature of the car. And they don't have a picture of it. It's got skylights inside the car. I drooled over this car as a kid when we were at the auto show in 2004. Well, I wasn't a kid anymore, but um, I was young. I was what, um, 25 years old. Um, I drooled over this car as a kid. But yeah, it's got skylights and a moonroof. And this is the one I have with the red interior. It's a red um, leather interior. It's all leather. I love my minivan. God, I love my minivan so much. Uh, I don't have this. I don't think I do. Oh, yes, I do. I do have the drop-downs with the screens. How long would it take you to pay the new car from delivering? I don't understand what that means. But this is, my, this is the minivan I have. I love my minivan. God almighty, I love my minivan. I even got the headphones because it's got wireless headphones, you know, infrared headphones, so the kids in the back can listen to the 
movies playing on the dual LCD screens without everybody else having to listen to it. So you can have the radio playing just up front and the everything else playing for them in the back. Um, but yeah, it has these um, skylights on the roof. And you can close them. There's a cover to cover them. I love my Mini. It's so comfortable. It, I, we call it, we call it the Enterprise Shuttlecraft because the. Uh, well, well, let me show you the dash. When you when you see the dash, you'll understand. Uh, where's a good picture? Here's a good picture. Here we go. So here's the dash on the car. So there's actually nothing in front of the driver here. I do a lot of long distance driving. Let me tell you, that is wonderful. It takes a little bit to get used to because you're not used to looking down and not seeing anything. But once you get used to it, you wonder how you could live without it. It is so wonderful to not have that light shining up in your face from the dash. And so the dash is over here in the center. So there's your tachometer, speedometer, your info cluster. This is your GPS navigation media screen. And look at all the fucking buttons. It's just got a zillion fucking buttons. You, you can't use the buttons while you're driving. There's too many of them. <laughs> the later years, they simplified it. But and you got all the buttons on the steering wheel, and you got all the buttons down here. You can move the mirrors. The mirrors are heated. You can move the seats. The seats are heated. You can move the pedals. The pedals move. It's got power move pedals. It's, it's Basically, when they came out with the 2004 Nissan Quest, um, Nissan went to the engineers and said, here's a blank check go crazy and they did they went fucking crazy <laughs> they put everything in the kitchen sink in it um this is actually a glove box up here which is really handy i put my gloves in there my id stuff like that um this is a pull out cup holder this is a pull out storage this is your six disc changer with a 400 watt bose sound system you crank the stereo in this minivan and you just go to heaven <laughs> It sounds so good. It's so freaking good. Um, you know, I got the red leather dash, all that. Heated steering wheel. Heated seats. All leather, all power. Memories. I mean, th it's a luxury car in a minivan. And it's got everything. I drooled over this car for a decade. You know, dreaming of owning one. And I finally eventually bought one when the price went low enough that I could afford one. <laughs> and, um... Oh, I love my minivan. Oh, I love my minivan so much. I lost the title for it. I've actually got to order a new title from Pennsylvania. So I can get it transferred over to here. But, yeah, this, this van is just... It's, it's incredible. It's just... You look inside this thing, and it's just like, wow. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? It's nice. So I have the problem of, um, you know, my gut is a little big, so I got the seat back. But that makes the pedals a little far away. Being able to make those pedals go, it's nice. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I didn't like about the the Nissan Quest is the only thing I didn't like about it. The seats suck. They're strong. They're durable. They look wonderful. They're not comfortable. They're For me, they hurt my back a little bit. On the really long drives, you got to get out every now and then and walk. I think it's just because I'm too big. But besides the seats not being the most comfortable seats in the world... Um, like the seats in my Kia and my Nissan are a million times better. But, um, beyond that, it's an amazing vehicle. It's just, it's, it's, it, they threw the kitchen sink in there. I mean, it has everything. Everything that was available in 2004. Obviously, there's more goodies available today, but, um, yeah, uh, I love that vehicle. That was a really nice shape and pretty low miles, too. Except it's got these ugly gray seats. Yuck. Yuck. Huh.
It's got all power doors. So the hatch, the side doors all open up by the push of a button. I can just push a button, open a sliding door. They're starting to fail on mine. The um, the way they work is to avoid crushing somebody. If they sense a strain, they will stop and reverse. Well, mine have gotten old enough that just the strain of moving causes that sensor to trigger, and it'll, it'll so you'll tell it to close, and it'll go, dee, 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 and it'll open back up again. So you got to help it closed. Um, open up the tailgate, just press a button. The remote has individual buttons for the sliding doors, the locks, and the hatch. So with a push of a button on the remote, I can open the siding doors or the hatchback or the, the tailgate just from the remote. It's The car is amazing. <laughs> it really is a pretty amazing vehicle. Huh. You want a cheap vehicle, you get like a Dodge Caravan. Like, here we go. Oh. Fifteen hundred bucks for a, you know, Dodge Grand Caravan. You know, it's just a cheap old minivan. You know, it's got. Well, that's obviously wrong. There's no way it only has fifteen thousand miles. Uh, looks like motor and transmission are. Oh, motor and transmission good. I'm surprised. It says the motor and trans are good. I would definitely take it for a test drive. Nice solid acceleration, then a nice soft acceleration. See if you get that hesitation in the shift. If you get that hesitation in the shift, be a little wary. Might not be a big deal, especially for a $1,500 vehicle, but it could prove to bite you in the end run. I'm guessing that's 150,000 miles, not 15,000. But um, here's another. Here's actually that's actually a nicer one, but more miles. But um, 2002 Grand Caravan and something besides gold. You know, it's in a nice red color. And it, it's the 3.3, which is okay. I prefer the 3.0. I think it was a better motor. Um, you definitely need a valve cover gasket. You can see your valve cover gasket's leaking there. Um, otherwise, that's not in bad shape. That's actually not in bad shape at all. Damn. Damn. It's even got decent shoes. They don't show pictures of the rest of the outside, though. Like, I want to see that. That looks like that looks like the hood is peeling. That's either dirt on the windshield or that's paint peeling, clear coat peeling on the hood. Again, not a big deal. It's a cosmetic thing. But um, twenty seven hundred's a little high for that age of vehicle, but that's not a bad price in today's environment. Um, that's too expensive. Um, that's not horrible. The Chrysler Town and Country is the ha it'll have the nicer amenities. I owned a lot of caravans. <laughs> I owned four of them. <laughs> um, you know, we would put three hundred thousand miles on it, and then we would sell it and get another one because they're, they're just comfortable. They're efficient. They're one of the they're one of the more reliable minivans. Minivans have a problem with eating transmissions. Like, um, do not buy a Ford Windstar. <laughs> Stay away from Ford Windstars. Bad. Ford Ford Econoline cargo van? They'll run fucking forever. We actually had a Ford um, engineer come out to our store in New Jersey when one of his customers told him about one of our vans having over 500,000 miles on it. He didn't believe it. He actually came out and inspected the van. He couldn't believe it. But the, the that was when they had the inline six engine with the, with the five-speed stick shift. So we're talking 1984, 1985. <laughs> Um, they were great, though. Those vans would just run. The only reason we didn't drive that van anymore is we sheared the bolts off the power steering. So you couldn't just replace the power steering pump. It'd be very hard to replace it. And um, it wasn't worth much at the time. You know, it was 2005. It was a 1985 vehicle. And it took two of us to turn it from a standstill. If we were at a stop and we had to turn, when you were moving, you could turn it. But when we were at a stop, it took two of us <laughs> to turn the wheel enough to make it turn. It was hilarious. Uh, I'm surprised we never sheared the um, one of the joints on the, the steering column. But that was funny, though. Oh, my God. 
Uh, Honda Odyssey, I don't know if I'd want a Honda that old. It's only got 127,000 miles, but still. Yeah, that's getting really up there in age. Mm. 94 Dodge Ram Van. Those things are desirable to some people. Uh, here's a Mazda 5. 3,600 bucks. That's not that bad. It's 180,000 miles, but that's not that bad. Everything works. Wow. That's not, that's actually not that bad. It's a 2009, so it's only 13 years old. You know, 13 year old minivan in relatively decent shape. The price is right in the middle of the range for book value, but, um, and it looks like it's in decent shape. You know, you got your, your typical driver seat wear. You know, every time you sit down, you're rubbing that spot with your calves. So that's your typical driver seat wear. Passenger seat looks fine. Dash looks fine. Back seats look great. Um, that looks fantastic. A uh, little bit of staining. So they probably had kids. And exterior-wise, the paint looks great. For a desert vehicle, that's not bad. The 180,000... Oh, manual trans... It's a manual? Really? It's a stick shift? Oh, that's fucking... It is! Is the, is it? Is that a clutch pedal? I need to see this picture. <laughs> I never saw a stick shift minivan. Oh, now I'm interested. Because <laughs> the biggest concern is the transmission, but a manual transmission, unless you beat the fuck out of it, you ain't killing that. No, that does not look like a stick shift to me. Well, yeah, I guess it would be. That would be the brake pedal, that would be the clutch, and the gas pedal should be over here. Is this actually a stick shift? That is so cool. I didn't know they had a manual minivan. And it looks nice, too. I like the wheels. Wow. I'm impressed. I want to save that just because I want to ask him if that's actually a stick shift. <laughs> that's inc I, I never heard of anything. What? 2006 Aquatoline extended for 25 grand? You're nuts. <clears throat> Here's another one. Uh, that says automatic. Let's see if the pedals look different. Uh, they only have two pictures. What year was that? 2009. I never heard... Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I did hear of the old Dodge minivans. I did not know that was a thing. That is freaking cool. Here, let me show you. That. That is what I learned to drive on. <laughs> when I learned to drive, I learned to drive on that. That's the, that is the van. The same color. Mine, of course, ours was all faded. It wasn't bright red. It was a matte finish red. But this is what I learned to drive on. And it was a stick shift. Big, long shifter coming out of the floor, man. Da, 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 da. <laughs> this is what I learned to drive on when, I, when we got... Uh, we had two of these. We had a blue 84 and we had the red 85. And um, the... Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was the red 84, blue 84. Where? <laughs> Red 84, blue 85. That blue 85, I drove out to Colorado and back. <laughs> Put a mattress in the back. I just pulled over into a rest stop, crawled into the back, went to sleep. Got up, drove another six or seven hours. <laughs> it was crazy. But yeah, here, here we go. Right there. That is the van. That's the van that I learned to drive on. I drove that van for years.
and then the car that I missed so much. I eventually sold it because it was a sin to let the car rot in the mud hole it was rotting in. Um, I wish I could get another one. It'll never happen. But this was my baby. I had one of these. I love driving that car so much. It was so much fun to drive that car. And mine looked exactly like that, except it wasn't glossy. The paint wasn't glossy anymore, but otherwise, exactly like that. Um, I had a new top for it. I got new moon caps for it. I love that car. God, I miss that. Oh, my, my fuel cap was um, silver, not black. Oh, man, I miss that car. I mean, that was a driver's car. You, it was manual brakes, manual steering, manual shifting. Everything was manual. There was no power, anything in that car. I mean, the win the window, well, my window was different. My window was split. So the, there was a seam going right down the window here. I could probably find an example of it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, there it is. So see how the window split? So my driver's window was split like that. So this was snapped closed with snaps. And what you could do is you could pop those snaps open so that you can open that window and stick your hand out, for example, to pay a toll or something like that. <laughs> um, but, oh, God, I love this car. I, I wish I could have gotten the duck board. You could do this. I did this all the time. Take the doors off because it's an actual full tub. So the doors just unclip and pop right off. The windows just stick right into two holes in the top of the door, and then the whole door just pops right off. Kuba wagon. It's a mix between a Jeep, a Beetle, and a Kuba wagon. Take those three, squish them together, have weird porno sex, and you'd get this. <laughs> um, but yeah, God, I love that car. Look at all these upgrades, man. Uh, I, I, I would have. I wanted that bumper. I wanted that rack. I wanted the duck. I did get the roll cage. I did get a roll cage for it. I had a roll cage inside. Um, I, I think that's standard. I think they all came with that. I'm not sure. Uh, I've seen them without it, so I, I don't know if that's standard, but I added it to mine. Um, God, I miss that car. You, you can't touch one of these without a mortgage now. These things are so expensive now. I had two of them. I had a... I had a what was it? A 73, I had a white 73, and I had an orange 74. Um, I blew the tranny in the orange one. I was I was working at Radio Shack, so this was 2004-ish. Um, I was working at Radio Shack. I finished my shift. I pulled out of the parking lot. I pulled up to the traffic light, and when I put it in first gear and let off the clutch... All I got was the ring, ding, 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 ding. And I was like, fuck. I put it in second, put it back in first again. And I let out the clutch again. The ring, ding, 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 ding. I was like, fuck. We had to push it back into the park lot, get a towed. Uh, turns out the transmission blew apart. So I was like, okay, I have two of them. I told the mechanic, I was like, okay, take the transmission out of the white one and put it in the orange one. week later he's done car works fine and then he informs me yeah we had to cut the transmission out of the white one I look at him I'm like what do you mean you had to cut the transmission out of my ten thousand dollar car <laughs> I saw his face drop <laughs> I was like explain that to me <laughs> he's like the frame was bent a little bit we couldn't unbolt the transmission so I torched it out I was like so instead of calling me and telling me hey Chris the transmission stuck in the white car we would have to torch it out at which point I would say no problem leave it alone I'll call up Thing Shop and order another transmission for $164 plus shipping. Because <laughs> at the time, you can get transmissions for that price. And I was like, and instead, you chose to chop up my $10,000 car? 
Because <laughs> restored, they were worth ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. The idea was I would use the white one as a parts car to keep the orange one running until I restored the orange one. And then I would restore the white one, sell it, and pay for everything. And he took a torch to it and cut the frame to get the transmission out. Yeah, him and I never spoke again after that. That we, that, that relationship was done. <laughs> uh, I, w I wouldn't let him change a tire on my car for free. <laughs> I ended up selling that fucking white one for 700 bucks Because that's all it was worth after that. It was parts. You fucking piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you cut the transmission out of the car! <laughs> oh my god. Uh, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? You see why I wanna eat people? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Some people, that's all they're good for. Food. <laughs> Oh my god, I wanted to kill him. I wanted to murder him. I wanted to... Oh, <laughs> oh my god, look at this pink and white one. <laughs> uh, I think these were called Kabata Tops. Oh wow, a stretch one. Holy crap. A stretch thing. Well, that costs a lot. Or took up a donor car. Oh my god. How about a 74 thing with a Buick V8 engine in it? <laughs> I could just see the frame going. <laughs> oh man. They were fun cars though. That's the kind of car where you took the twisties at 35 miles an hour. And you felt like you were doing 100 in a race car. It just, it felt so good driving that car. It was, it was very, very relaxing. Yeah, you, you put the, you put the top down. You take the doors off, and you just go cruising. We were rubbernecking, looking at an accident at an intersection once, and you know, people were obviously looking at me because it's a, a very unique car. And, um, you know, the cop yelled something from across the intersection. And I, and I was like, I really couldn't hear him. He finally got close enough. He yells, he's like, put your seatbelt on. <laughs> I, I actually had a little megaphone in the car. I don't know why. I was working at Radio Shack, and I had a megaphone from Radio Shack. And I pull out the megaphone. And I was like, it's from 1974. It only has lap belts. <laughs> And he was like, okay. <laughs> it was funny as hell. Oh, did you see the smart car with the Hayabusa? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is the one that I watched, but it'll be just as good. This is where they do psycho shit, like put a Hayabusa engine... Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> go watch that. Go go watch that video. <laughs> oh my god, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, uh, that's not the original one I watched, but it's just as entertaining. It's uh, what 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 grease monkeys and motorheads will do is just amazing. It's just you know why they like gas cars. This is why they like gas cars. Because you can do things like this. It's just... <laughs> oh my god, it's ridiculous. It's so good. Well, a smart car is an interesting... It's an interesting display of physics and engineering. So one of the ways they determine car safety is cabin intrusion. So you're in the car, you are in a cage inside that car. That that cabin is a cage that you're in. And the objective is to 
maintain the integrity of that cage because if you can keep anything from penetrating the cage you can keep it from penetrating the precious cargo the people inside so for example you don't want the steering wheel going for your chest <laughs> okay you don't want the dash going and cutting your legs off you can slam a smart car into a concrete wall at a 45 degree oblique at 70 miles an hour and the tritium cage will maintain its integrity you'll even still be able to open the doors but what people it's it is one of the safest cars structurally on the planet it, it has f1 race technology in this car they built this car to survive almost anything but there's a problem <laughs> It's not just about cabin intrusion. It's about forces of acceleration. The reason, for example, you take a flashlight or a remote made of plastic and you drop it and it shatters into pieces is all about acceleration. So when you take this object and drop it at 32 feet per second per second, the rate of acceleration of gravity from 6 feet into the ground well, it has to stop when it hits the ground. You know, it's moving. An object in motion remains in motion until acted upon by an external force. It took six feet to get to that speed. It's going to stop from that speed in 0 0.01 feet. Because you have a solid, rigid object hitting a solid, rigid object. Your tile floor, for example, or your concrete outside when you drop your phone so what happens is it accelerates at 1g and it decelerates for just a microsecond at a thousand g's well those materials can't handle a thousand g's so they go boom <laughs> and the thing shatters into a million pieces if you could if you could go from decelerating a thousand G's to just a hundred G's, that would make the difference between boom and hey, the road's fine. Keep clicking the TV. And the way you do that is by you have to add a crumple zone. You need to increase the deceleration length. So the amount of distance that you decelerate from your speed to zero over. Even going from zero to two millimeters of deceleration could mean the difference between 10,000 Gs and 100 Gs. It's that big of a difference. And when you have something like this that's made out of aluminum and glass, it's even worse because this will actually give a little bit. You know, this will bend a little bit. This actually has a tiny bit of give. This has no give. <laughs> so the deceleration zone is even shorter. So the way we do that is with a case. So this is a rugged phone, so it has a built-in case. But you'll notice the corners are enhanced. See those corners? That's, that's rubber there. It's only a couple of millimeters of rubber. But it's enough to go from 10,000 G's to 100 G's, which the phone can more than survive. I'm making numbers up here. But it's more than enough to make the difference between shattered and no damage. So, the same thing applies in your car. When you get T-boned by a semi, <laughs> you will instantaneously accelerate from zero miles per hour to whatever velocity the semi was going. And normally the way we survive this is by extending the amount of time it takes you to accelerate. We call this crumple zones and airbags. If we can make it so that instead of going, you go, it changes the difference between three weeks in a coma, three months in a coma, and walking away with a scratch. Well, the problem with the smart car is, no matter how well designed it is, and it is designed well, no matter how safe it is, it is ridiculously safe. The car is tidy. So the amount of crumple that you can add 
before the acceleration forces reach the occupant is limited. So no matter how much technology they pour into that, if you head on a semi or get T-boned by a semi, you're fucked. Because <laughs> there's just not enough car between you and the semi to ease you into that acceleration as the car hits you. So what happens is you're, you have your semi and you have your smart car and the semi T-bones the smart car. So remember, right now, the smart car is moving this way. All right? But it's not moving this way. So its velocity in this direction is zero. That semi hits you, he's, you know, he's 30,000 pounds empty. You know, and he's 100, well, 50,000 pounds empty. And he's 160,000 pounds full. You know, well, no, wait a minute. 40 tons, 80,000 pounds, or is it 80 tons? Is it 80,000 pounds or is it 80 tons? I forget what a fully loaded semi is. But it doesn't matter. He's ridiculously big and ridiculously heavy. Which means he's not going to crumple. You are the crumple zone. <laughs> Alright? Yeah, and a five-point artist. You are the crumple zone. So when he hits you, nothing happens to you. 40 tons, 80,000 pounds. Okay. So when the semi hits your car, nothing happens to you because the acceleration forces haven't reached you yet. Right now, the car is beginning to crumple. The car is beginning to go this way. And once the car has finished crumpling, it now has to move. And when the car moves, you will move with the car. So now you will experience the acceleration forces. And because there is so little car between you and the truck, the acceleration forces are huge. No matter how well built the car is. It doesn't matter. The, the car, there, there isn't a car better designed on the road today. Probably. At least at the time the car came out, there probably wasn't a safer car as far as an engineering point of view on the road than a Smart 4.2. But there's just not much car there. So if a semi T-boned you at speed... You fucked. <laughs> you know, um, I actually had to go to court for running a red light. I purposely ran the red light. I was laying on the horn and I drove through the red light. Um, the um, a semi was making an illegal right turn at the light. And the light was low. It was a low-hanging light. It was barely high enough for the semi. So the semi was blocking the light. Right? By the time... Now, we all started slowing down because this semi was making this illegal turn. When we realize he's making the illegal turn, we all begin to accelerate again. When he clears, we see a yellow light. The problem is we don't know how old the yellow light is. I am close enough that it's going to take a maximum braking action to stop in time for the light. Not really. Uh, let's call it 75% maximum braking action. I'm doing about 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. Maybe a little faster because it's a 45 mile an hour road. And I wasn't quite up to full speed yet. Now, I'm driving a Geo Metro. You don't stop for red lights in Geo Metros. You look first. <laughs> Okay, in any car, you look first. So the first thing I did was look left. There's a car next to me. That car is stopping. So I cannot go left. All right, left is not an option because there was a car next to me and he is stopping. I cannot go right. There is a curb to the right. You say, well, jump the curb. The curb is 15 inches tall. I have 12 inch wheels. You're not jumping the curb. You're crashing into a wall. Okay? Then I look behind me, and that's when I see a problem. There's a car coming up behind me, and he is doing substantially faster than the speed limit. He's probably doing about 60. The speed limit's 45. <laughs> this car will not be able to stop in time. 
He is not going to be able to stop in time. He is either going to crash into me, or he's going to swerve and crash into that guy. If he swerves to the right, he's going to hit the curb, which is going to bounce him, because it's a 15-inch curb, and he's going to crash into me. My sister is in the back seat of a tin can, a sardine can. If I do not run that red light, we're done. <laughs> he is going to hit me. He is going to kill my sister. She's dead. Okay? You get rear-ended doing almost zero with a car doing 60 in a Geo Metro, a 1994 Geo Metro. Two of us could lift up the rear of that car off the ground. Okay? The car weighs 1,600 pounds. It's a very light car. And the metal is thin. Like, I dented the roof of the bowling ball on purpose. <laughs> okay? So, he's going to hit us. The only option I have is to... I couldn't even hit the gas. It's a 49 horsepower manual. The car's not going anywhere if I hit the gas. If I hit the gas, the engine's going to go... And I might gain two miles an hour before he hits me. <laughs> okay? So, I can't accelerate. I can't brake. I can't go left. I can't go right. The only thing I can do is run the red light and hope he can swerve and miss me. You know, give him a get. Basically, I'm here. This car's here. If I can get far enough ahead to give him a place to go through, then he won't hit me. So I start tooting the horn of the car and I coast through the red light. There's a cop sitting at the Burger King. Somehow, this cop missed. The car doing 60 miles an hour, who threaded the needle between the silver car and me, threaded that needle with inches to spare, skidded his tires to pass me and run the red light with me. Somehow, the cop never saw that car, but he saw me. <laughs> so he pulls me over. <laughs> He's like, you know why I pulled you over? I was like, well, yeah, I just ran a fucking red light. <laughs> and he's like, well, that's a bit blunt. I was like, well, it's better than being dead. <laughs> and he looks at me like, it's like, did you miss the guy doing 60 who threaded the needle and ran the light with me who was going to kill me if I tried to stop? He's like, no, I just saw you. I was like, of course you did. Just write me your ticket. I'll see you in court. <laughs> So, I get to court. I guess they're used to hearing everything from people. I get to court, and I explain I had no choice. There were exigent circumstances. Stopping at the red light was lethal. And he's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like listen to me. I was like, I'm not fucking with you. And that got his attention, because I guess people don't normally talk about like that. I was like, I have video. Somehow, this officer completely did not see the car that almost murdered me had i stopped i'd be my sister would be dead and i would either be dead or in a hospital because i was doing less than 30 and he was doing 60 at least and the car next to me was stopping and i'm in a geo metro that little tiny itty bitty hatchback geo metro weighs 1600 pounds actually i think mine weighed 14 14 or 16 and I was like, I'm not kidding you. There was no choice. I actually had time to figure out what to do. And I came to the conclusion the only way I was living was to go through the red light. And, and, and the DA wanted to just... Uh, and the cop was like, yeah. Uh, and the judge said, like, let me see the video. This is before we go into court. I play the video. And I pause it. And I was like, okay. I was like, you can see the truck just cleared. And we have a stale yellow. And we have to figure out what to do. He's like, okay. I was like... This silver car is stopping. That curb is 15 inches high. I was like, there's a guy behind me right now doing at least 60. He will not stop in time for this light. So if I stop, he's either going to hit me, which will kill my sister and probably kill me, or he's going to swerve left and hit the silver car, or he's going to swerve right, hit the curb, and bounce into me and still kill me. And, he, and, the, and I see the cop going. And then I hit play on the video. Because uh, I have a dash cam. And he sees the silver car go. Shoo! <laughs> 
as I'm in the intersection, you hear my horn going, and you see this other silver car go, shoom! And both the judge and the DA go, and the cop goes, and the DA goes, how did you miss him? <laughs> And I guess that I probably because I was honking the horn, the cop was tunnel visioned on me, and so the other car just never registered. I don't think he was a bad cop. I think he really didn't see the other car, which is why I'm thankful I had a dash cam. <laughs> um, so the um, the DA and the judge look at each other, and the cop just goes, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, that guy threaded the needle between the stopped car in the left lane. And my rear bumper, I was like, I'm in a 1,600-pound Geo Metro. If I stopped, we wouldn't be here right now. I'd be in a morgue. <laughs> I was like, what else could I do? I mean, I didn't have a choice. You know, it wasn't like a split-second thing. I had like five or six seconds. No, this is before I had a YouTube channel. I wish. I had it on a laptop. I brought in a laptop tablet computer. To play the video for him. This is before I had a YouTube channel. But, um, before I did a whole lot with YouTube. But I wish. I wish I had these old videos because they'd be great. I have, I had so many little clips from back then that would just be, that would make a great compilation. <laughs> so, uh, the DA and the judge look at each other like, what do we do? And he's like, uh, how about we drop the charges? $30 court costs. I was like, fine. I was like, I'm happy with that. <laughs> Because a red light ticket's really bad for insurance. Because <laughs> I did run the light. I mean, I did run the light, but I had no choice. I mean, what what can I do? I mean, uh. <laughs> but um, well, to be honest, Michael, um, most F one car drivers don't have to worry about being T boned by a semi. <laughs> I mean, if you, you if you T bone an F one car driver with a semi, he's probably going to be in pretty bad shape too <laughs> um but um you know it's it's things like that you know uh one time in this car here oh here you can see the doors taken off this is cool here's the car with the doors taken off that's actually pretty close to what mine look like same roll cage same colors you know roughly the same condition my paint was in about that condition that's about what my car looked like you want to know what was ridiculously expensive on this car? I'm talking, it was it was this car's unobtainium, this car's kryptonite, where if this part broke, you were in trouble. This right here. It's one of the few components that's unique to this car. That little thing right there. That is your windshield wiper motor. Yeah, the windshield wiper motor sticks right under the windshield. And here's the wiring harness going into the car. And that shaft goes straight through the glass, and that's what runs your wipers. That was a very hard-to-come-by part. When I found one of those parts in the junkyard, it wasn't even on a car. But I knew what it was as soon as I saw it. I snatched that bitch. I couldn't believe the junkyard sold it to me for five bucks. <laughs> They gave it to me for five bucks. Those things are, a, this was 20 years ago. Those things were $160. <laughs> um, the, um, so I kept that. Mine never died, so I never, my, it got slow, but it never died. But um, I kept that, and I gave it to the guy when I sold him the car. <clears throat> because that's just a very valuable part. That's like crazy, crazy valuable. The other issue is when, um, um, the car has this molding. It's like um, metal and rubber together. Um, so it's, it's metal, so it's bendable and it'll hold its shape. And this is the molding that goes around all the metal edges of the car. One of the problems you'd have is it would shrink. And um, so you'd have to re-bend everything and push it down because it, when it would shrink, it would pull away from these quarters, for example, because it, it shrank over time. You know, but yeah, this this car. You don't want to get into an accident in this. <laughs> You get into an accident, this you're in trouble. But um, you know, it was just such a fun car. God, I love that car so much. So one time, driving home, Route 206, what three o'clock in the morning, roughly, 
and I'm driving home to Pennsylvania. I'm on Route 206 in South Jersey. I'm chugging along at about 45 miles an hour. And um, the speed limit is um, 50. But this car doesn't like going 50. It gets, it gets ornery when you try to go 50. It was stock, military transmission, gearbox, military tires. I didn't have normal road tires on it. It, it was the stock Kuba wagon tires it came with. They're, they look like truck tires, like you see on a deuce. And um, that little forty, that little 36 horsepower air-cooled engine uh, with that transmission, the max speed's about 50. You can maybe do 55, but you're gonna you're gonna blow an engine seal. It, it's too many RPMs. It can't handle it. And um, the, you could get the engine had the power, but the gearing was wrong. They actually made an upgrade where you took a um, a 72 bug transmission. And you could put it in one of these, I think. And that would give you highway speeds. Although, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable at highway speeds and something like that. <laughs> um, so, I'm driving home. There's no other cars on the road. I haven't seen a car in 20 minutes. Um, and this little Japanese ricer car, you know, a Subi or something like that. Or a um, uh, RSX or whatever the hell they are. One of, the, one of those little Japanese ricer cars with the wing on the back. Orange and silver. You know, nice paint job. He blows by me doing a hundred something. <laughs> He's got to be doing double my speed. Got to be. I mean, my car goes run, 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 shakes when he passes me. And he wasn't a truck. He was a little one of those little ricers. And just zoom. <laughs> I hear that pop, 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 pop as he downshifts and goes around the corner. <laughs> well, about a mile later, this cop pulls me over. And I'm like, what the hell is he pulling me over for? I f I'd forgotten about the other car. And uh, I was like, it, it, he comes up to the uh, the door, and, um, you know, the the top's down, the doors are off, you know, this is, you know, you know, it's an old car. And he says, you know why I pulled you over? And I was like, I guarantee you it's not what you think. <laughs> he looks at me, and he says, I clocked you doing 88. <laughs> I looked at him and says, no, you did. <laughs> He's like, are you trying to argue with me? I was like, no, this isn't an argument. You're wrong. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was like, y you lost before you even pulled me over. I was like, this car can't do 88. <laughs> He's like, I clocked you. I was like, no, I interrupted him. I was like, you clocked the little Japanese ricer doing 88. And I guarantee you, he was doing better than 88. <laughs> he was doing a buck, buck 20 at least. <laughs> and he looks at me weird. I was like, did you look at the car yet? <laughs> and he's like, what? I was like, seriously, I'm, I'm not trying to be a dick. Uh, this is back in the days when we didn't know yet cops would kill you on a whim. <laughs> but I was, like, I was like, I'm not trying to be an asshole here. But serious question. Did you look at what I'm driving? And he's like, what's that mean? I was like, I got the pink slip in the glove box. I was like, I'll give you the keys. If you can hit 60, you can have the car. He looks at me, he's like, are you fucking with me? I was like, I was like, I was like, dude, this car can't even reach 60. I was like, the reason I'm on 206 and not the expressway is is because I would probably legally be a hazard on the expressway. This car can't do 55 without blowing a seal. 50 is about its maximum speed. It will never do 60. If you shoved it off the side of a mountain, maybe it would hit 88 before it hit the ground. Maybe. But it's built like a brick. It still might not hit 88 as a missile. <laughs> Uh, no, it was getting close. Oil was starting to pop out of the seal when I tried to go faster. And that's when I realized I was like, it started spraying oil out the seal. And my mechanic told me if I would have kept that up, it probably would have blown the seal right out, the, the main crank seal. It just, it, the, the RPMs were too high. I was redlining it. I didn't realize it. And because um, the transmission's geared too low. The transmission's geared for 35 to 45, not 65. <laughs> so when I got it up to like 55, 56 miles an hour, it, it started getting, like smoke was coming out the back. And when I stopped and pulled over, there's oil everywhere. He told me if I had to push it a little longer, it would probably have blown the seal right out of the engine. It's like you were just, it was just turning too fast. And um, so the cop finally stops, takes a half step back and looks at it. 
I was like, this is a 1974 Volkswagen Type 181, commonly referred to as the Thing. I was like, look at the tires, listen to the engine. It's a 36 horsepower air cooled engine geared for mud work with military mud tires. I was like, this car is literally not capable of doing 60, not to speak of 88. It simply can't do it. No matter how long you hold that gas pedal, it's never going to get to 60, not to speak of 88. It just can't do it. <laughs> and I, he sat there, he thought for a minute, and I, I, I think he realized that I wasn't being an asshole, that I was being literal, and that maybe he did see a newer looking car when he woke up when he was hiding in the woods with the radar gun. <laughs> He's like, he's like, okay, I believe you. <laughs> it's like, I'll let, you, I'll, I'll let you go. You have a great night. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, like I, I'll be honest, the car couldn't do 60. I, I would have won that bet. The, the, the car would never reach 60. <laughs> Maybe downhill. <laughs> you know, down if I drove to Albuquerque and put it in neutral so I wasn't spinning the engine, I could probably hit 60. <laughs> that was hilarious. That was just... <laughs> oh man I miss that car so much god that was a fun car <sighs> it's amazing how many pictures there are of them <sighs> oh wow look at that what is that oh that's a beetle conversion wow very pretty oh this is what it looks like all chopped down Top off, windshield down. They're fun cars. They are just fun car. I I lost the keys to the car. Now it was a it was a fun car, so I didn't have to drive it. So I waited a couple of months. It was like a month and a half, two months. And I finally fit, got fed up. I was like, okay, I need to get a key. I called up the local locksmith. You know, we 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 weren't we weren't first name basis, but we knew each other. Um, call up the local locksmith. Explain. You know, I have an old car. Lost the key. He's like, you know, yeah, it's about 70 bucks, but, you know, it's more if we have to come out. I was like, it's okay, I'll bring it to you. He's like, how are you going to do that? I'll just take the door off. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I walk into his shop with that door <laughs> and plop it on the counter. He's like, holy shit, you weren't kidding. Because <laughs> it's not normally that easy to take a door off a car. <laughs> And it was a single key car. The same key worked on the door and the engine. And, um, so I leave him the door. He calls me two days later and says, okay, your key's done. I come in. I try it on the door. It works. I get home. I try it in the ignition. It works. I walk upstairs. I turn to go into my bedroom. And I see the fucking key sitting under the encyclopedias right there on top of the little desk thing thingy rolling desk thingy I had in my room and I was like you motherfucker <laughs> two months give up seventy dollars get a new key and there's the goddamn keys right there I found them within 30 seconds of walking in the house <sighs> oh! <laughs> it always works that way always works that way Nah! <laughs> oh, look at that purple one. Well, that's nice. Oh, man, I missed that car. Oh, this was a coveted piece. The hard top. I spent years looking for a hard top for this car. You know, one that I could afford. Never found one. Oh, man, that is a, that's a rare gem right there. The hard top for this car. Whew. There's that extended one again. There's a pink one for you, Michelle. Look at that buggy version. Jesus. Oh yes! You I love that. You're talking about this. 
I wanted to do this to my Geo Metro. I wanted to do this to my Geo Metro, and of course I never got around to it. I'm going to leave the audio off. This shouldn't cause a uh, copyright infection. Mini trailer. And we found one. Comes from the trailer state of India. Yeah, this has got a lot of views, so it might be monetized, so I'm going to leave the audio off. But yeah, this is... um. They put this little harness across the roof of the car. And the length from here to the trailer was long enough for either end of the car. So the car, you could actually pull into it sideways. And it was a little ball hitch. And you, you'd hitch up the car. And you could, you could drive the car 360 degrees while attached to the trailer. Absolutely amazing. So you could do this. You could turn around and face the trailer while connected to it, which made backing into a site so easy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Could you imagine how easy it would be to back a trailer in doing that? It would be a piece of cake. Uh, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I, I loved it so much. It was so... Actually, this is probably the clip of it doing the full circle. Look. Watch, watch, watch. This is great. Isn't that great? Look at that. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> I wanted to build one so bad. Oh my God, so badly I wanted to build one. That's just cool. There's just something cool about that. Oh, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Oh, a modern beetle with a camper. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, turn it into an RV? That's that's not a that's just an RV. <laughs> wow! Oh, here's one. There's another one. Wow! Oh wow! So they, they it's still around. Look at that! It's all repainted and everything. Oh, that's fantastic. That is so cool. Oh, here's another one. Look at that! I never saw a second one. That beige one was the only one I ever saw. Oh, that is so cool. Boy, look at that finish on that. <clears throat> Jesus. I That's the only time I've ever seen a second one. I've never seen a second one. Here's the same red one. Wow. Here's another one. That's a custom-made one. Somebody made that. That's not that original one. That's somebody who copied the design. That is so cool. See, I like beetles. I'd be tempted. Who cares? When, when you're camping, it's about leisure. It's about enjoying the adventure and the ride. You don't want to go fast. It'll, it'll do 50 miles an hour. That's enough. Well, maybe not on today's highways. <clears throat> That might not be enough on today's highways. But um, but back then, the speed limit was 55 in the whole country. So it really was no big deal. Oh, man, that is so cool. I can't believe I've now seen three of them. That's awesome. Well, two plus a copy. Hey, here's a gold one. That looks like a model, actually. That looks like a model car. <laughs> No, there's other pictures of it. Oh, that's the same one as this one. That's this one. The video is just not as clear color. So that's the same car. Okay. I'd love to get a Beetle because a Beetle is one of those cars where I would fit. Because of the bubble top, I would actually fit in a Beetle. <clears throat> that is so cool. I'm seeing if there's any more, but I don't think so. I think that's all there is. Just those two, plus the, the, the copy. Let's try that other one that you saw, Tacozilla. Sima Tacoma. Uh 
there's a picture. See, you talking about that? That just looks like a cab over. You know, like a pickup truck with a, a sliding camper. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it's just all integrated. Oh, just twelve to thirteen thousand dollars used, if you can find one. So they built an integrated camper for a Tacoma. Okay. And um, if you used a modern Beetle, you wouldn't have a problem with speed. You'd still be able to do sixty-five. Of course, if you use the original air-cooled Beetle, then yeah, you're going to be a little bit on the slow side. <laughs> to make the Tacoma oh man alrighty guys it's 3.30 I'm going to call it I want to go down to Costco. I want to get some more of that pumpkin pie. See if they have a good deal on some meatballs. Because they're pretty expensive here in, um, in town here. So Costco might have a better deal. And since I'm going there anyway, might as well see what else they got. So that's it. Um, we will be back next week. Um, we're probably going to do the um, the P3 Micro 5-in-1. supposed to be an IDEX. So I've got that machine out in the car, so we should be doing that next week, and I will see you guys later. You guys have a great day. Thank you very much for supporting me. You make sure you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year if I don't see you next week. So enjoy your holidays. If you're traveling, be careful. Please be careful. If you do any holiday shopping, I'd appreciate you checking out my links in the description. That's how I make my income. You use those links, I make money. And that's it. I will see you guys later.